Yo, how are you doing, folks? Welcome to episode 79 of the Simple Life Podcast. 79, I did not think we'd get this far. I was kind of hopeful, kind of optimistic, kind of glad we have. I'll let you in on a little secret as well, folks. I am currently building, as you can probably tell by all of the bloody knuckles, and actually drilled a hole in my thumb the other day, you should probably see that. Um, I'm building a new studio out of recycled and upcycled pallet wood. It's going to be this really dark stained juxtaposed with this green, you know, the green on my logo that we've all come to know and love uh, that represents the plant that we all know and love. So yeah, next few weeks we'll be building up in there. My secret UK guest is being uh, announced uh, next week as well. Hell, I might even announce it at the end of this one uh, as I've just had confirmation from them uh, yesterday. So yeah, ooh. but today we have another secret special guest. When I say a secret, I did tell you fine folks last week, but how many of you actually listen to this damn thing? More and more every week, it would seem if I look at my analytics. Um, but yeah, this week's guest, terrible segue, but we'll bounce with it. We'll keep rolling. We'll keep rolling. Uh, this week's guest is a cannabis, I, this is going to be a long one, cannabis advocate, activist, a new father. He is the founder of the United Patients Alliance, a Berkshire Cannabis Club, a private uh, prescription cannabis patient, former writer at iSmart Media, my old job, Bill Maher joke there, um, <laughs> who's worked with uh, the UK CSC, which is the United Kingdom Cannabis Social Club Movement, uh, Normal UK, and the Legalized Cannabis Alliance, which is now better known as CLEAR. He is Clark French. How are you doing, brother? Hi, yeah, good, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. I am very good. I'm not as caffeinated as I usually am, so that went really well. I'm actually, yeah, I'm rolling pretty good. <laughs> so you're uh, enjoying a nice uh, volcano there. Yes, uh, volcano bags. That's my uh, preferred method of consumption these days. Nice, nice. Uh, I suppose as well, as per the introduction I saw on social media, actually a lot more recent than I would have anticipated, yourself becoming a private uh, prescription patient. Mm -hmm. So is that what you're currently consuming? Uh, this one is not. The, the one I just had was, so... Oh, this is a juxtaposition. Oh, tell the area. difference. It's a grey area. Well, yeah, I mean, that's it. I have I have an example for you right now. So this is a question because I, I know you like to ask questions on this show. So this is my legal cannabis prescription pot with my name on it, with the date. It's not very nice. In fact, it's awful, if I'm 100% honest. Mm -hmm. This is my... Not awful cannabis that isn't grown by a big company. It's grown with love and by a person at home, very close to me, locally grown, locally grown craft cannabis. It's important. Mm -hmm. What happens if I do this? Just, just a question. Oh, you just broke the system. Just, just oh. a question. That's just a question now. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't have the answer to that question, but... You know, and what happens now? Let's come out again. Oh, right. Arrest him. Arrest him. Arrest him. Wrong packaging. Oh, no, he's fine. He's fine. Sorry. Sorry, sir. I'm sorry. You genuine patient. You wonderful human. Criminal. Arrest him. Lock him in a cage. It's, that is where, that's, where we're, that's where we're at. That is literally where we're at. Uh, it's, that, um, you know, it's mind boggling. It really is. But mm. at the same time, if we look back, you know, either of these criminal, arrest him. Mm -hmm. You know, only 2018 we went back and that was the case. So, yeah, you can't say there's not been any progression. Has it been the right progression? Well, this is it's difficult, yeah. Because I mean, now I'm going to bring one of my later questions, I think, further mm -hmm. forward uh, as we're on the subject already here. It's mm -hmm. three and a half years, basically, next month. I think it'll be six months. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's how it works. Uh, I think, yeah, that's how, that's how the year works. There's 12 of those months. You, you know, we got used to it. The Romans changed the these days, two more days. These days. Yeah, yeah, these days. You know, that Augustine added all that. Yeah, we get it. Anyway, so we're on the Gregorian calendar. I'm glad we're all caught up. Um, <laughs> so basically, yeah, three and a half years have passed since the change of the legislation of this creation of Schedule 2. We've had three. One, two, three. One, two, three. NHS prescriptions, and according to your man, uh, Professor Mike Barnes, who I spoke to the other day to clarify, we're as near as can be 15,000 private prescriptions. Yeah. They quoted during the campaign, if you remember, statistics that came out of, I think it was Vault Face that pushed the statistic, but I don't think it was them that correlated it. 1.4 million people in the UK use cannabis for therapeutic yeah. reasons. So how do those numbers not add up. There's a huge jump between 15,003 mm -hmm. and 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. But equally, there's a huge jump between zero and 15,000. Very so, true. Very true. So 
whilst I agree with you, I really do. Like it, it does not, this isn't the system I was fighting for. I'll tell you that for sure. Mm. This is not the system that I was fighting for. But is it better that, than what was before? 100%. Mm. So, you know, we, we're in that position of we've won a battle, mm -hmm. but we've not won the war yet. And we've only moved like one or two trenches up. You know, we haven't, we haven't gained much ground from it. Yeah. But we have gained ground and we are victorious and we need to celebrate that victory and push that home. And that's what, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I want to do coming back. That's what I want to try to reinvigorate and re reignite and support people as well, because support isn't really necessary, especially when we're dealing with vulnerable, sick people. So, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I suppose exactly that. The, the... I mean, we could probably break down the 15,000 into there's going to be quite a few exploiters within that community uh, or that group. I don't want to say it's necessarily a community, although they are actively, I suppose, a community by the nature of they are collectivized by one common identifier. Um, there are people that are going, well, I'm going to go get the script and then put it in the pot, put it in yeah. the bag, have the paper that protects me so I'm not then a criminal. There are obviously then people who otherwise wouldn't have access, and I agree. This is where I entirely agree with the current, not the, necessarily the way the current system is implemented, but the conceptual uh, matrix of it, the, the apparatus of it, in the people that can't and have never bumped into or known somebody that grows cannabis, can buy yeah. cannabis, can get them cannabis, this system is helpful. But on the other side of it, the limitations of advertising and everything else mean that those people are not aware of it. The majority of people that know about cannabis on prescription and prescription cannabis as a concept mm -hmm. are people within the cannabis community or by extension, some people that are already involved in, in cannabis. So it creates this kind of perverse incentive, I think, in, in some ways as well to create a strong division between these two communities so that then the non-identifiers, they're then going, oh, well, it's medical. Or if this is all medical, I'm getting it from a doctor, I'm going to a clinic, a DPD driver is dropping off, it's all sealed, it's childproof, it's blah, 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 whatever. Um, and they're then going, this is all legitimate. And it juxtaposes that with the rest of that 1.3x mm -hmm. amount of million people that are growing, consuming, trading, however they're getting access to it in, in an illegal way. And it kind of, we saw a, an article at 420 and actually a few... <sighs> a few comments and statuses from individual, uh, quite influential individuals after 420, basically asking the questions, as we now do in our journalistic way, mm -hmm. amateur journalistic way of asking questions, is the optics of 420 bad for prescription cannabis as a movement? And it, again, it creates this kind of, this division of kind of, because they should be, should, they should be separate in one way, but also inclusive in the other, include, like together in the other, you know? I hear you, but I think there's always two sides to a coin. I think that's the pessimistic view. I think that's the pessimistic view, and there's a lot of truth in what you said, definitely. And there's certainly some people on both sides of the divide that really firmly believe that the opposing side is wrong. And I'm, I'm not one of those people. Um, I don't believe that there is a side. I believe there is a plant. And I believe that any person doing something for that plant is valid and should be supported, whether you agree with all the things I agree with or whether you disagree and you only, want, you only agree with one of them. Where everyone draws the line is different. I think you and I draw the line in a slightly different place, but... We respect each other enough to say, hey, you know what? I get why you draw the line there, and I get why you you draw the line there. And that's that's all I think we need to do as a community is just try and have this understanding and knowledge. So all of these things are dealt with by knowledge, by understanding, by teaching people, by teaching both sides about the other. And we're not going to yeah. do that if we're at each other's throat. We're only going to do that if we start coming together and recognizing we've got far more in common than we do that separates us. That our causes, maybe they, they you know, this, this campaign and this industry and this plant, it has like a billion niches, 
But all of those little niches, be it industry or campaign, they're all relevant and they all should be respected and supported. And once we can, once that community can kind of get over, you know, so it's, it's so new and it's so like fresh and it's so important and it's so like to the heart, it's like our lives, it's our very lives at stake. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's not new though. It's, there are people that are 40, 50 years into this and no, I mean, yeah. I mean leg- legally it's, it's so new so that that clear you know before whatever there was there or wasn't there a divide here you can you can say there is a divide look mm-hmm. you can show the evidence and you can prove it like so mm-hmm. you know, that's why i'm saying you're not wrong you're you're right there is like there is a divide of like if a policeman comes to me i'm fine but if a policeman comes to someone else who hasn't had the knowledge or whatever maybe they're not and but it's not the knowledge. It's it's been able to pay, it's been able to pay for the script. If you can afford the script, you're safe. Because now the qualifying yeah. criteria is well, maybe maybe if, it's if the you've knowledge. got any any ailment, but then you have to come to yeah. the knowledge. I agree. I but mean, the, pro- I mean, the problem I mean, is the ability of your knowledge. If you get what I'm saying, right? So people are mm-hmm. unaware that that is the case a lot of the time, and then they could have got a prescription, but maybe they don't know about it. So but, it's, they haven't. So mm-hmm. there's there's definitely going to be people out there. Again, you're not wrong, but I'm not wrong either here. Yeah, ag- agreed. But the majority of the people that I speak to, obviously my community, I suppose, is slightly yeah. different. I mean, as part yeah. of my shout out Product Earth role as community liaison yeah. representative, I do obviously liaise with people from from Hydro, from CBD, from the uh, air quotes, uh, low cannabis hemp industry, uh, low THC cannabis hemp industry, um, and the, the medical sector, you know, from, from prescription cannabis. I do try to interact with patients as well and try to take in a wide berth of knowledge. And one of the things that I see here is a gulf in education yeah. is that the narrative that is now being set is from what I call the medical cannabis industrial complex, which I suppose yeah. I need to start changing because actually I won a victory with Mike Barnes in that they're going to start calling it prescription cannabis because mm-hmm. medical cannabis is a misnomer. It mm-hmm. creates a concept that this is medical cannabis. This is cannabis. Therefore that's not medical. It doesn't have medical properties when anybody can turn any cannabis plant into in some way, some beneficial or therapeutic mm-hmm. substance, even if you just end up juicing it and use it for its omegas, if you use then it's seed oils, if you then end up using its flowers for various extracts or, or different consumption methods, you know what I mean? It's all going to supplement that endocannabinoid system in that we all have an endocannabinoid system. We should all have the right to supplement it in the same way. It's, it's weird as if it's as if we now discovered scurvy, there would be a system set up to get prescription vitamin C. Mm. Would, rather than recognizing everybody has this deficiency, this deficit, this system that could be benefited from it and creating a ubiquitous access system, they're creating a, a pay to play. Mm. So the system I worry for most within this is that or rather the, the one enemy, if you want to say that there are these camps, mm. exactly that I agree. There needs to be a parlay, a decent discussion and coming together because there is only one enemy and it's not within us or it's rather they've infiltrated us. And it's neoliberalistic capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's exploitation. It's the idea of creating quarterly profit on the suffering and misery of others. It's Mm -hmm. the idea of going, oh, you're not allowed to formulate your own independent relationship with cannabis. You have to go to a doctor that knows far less than you, go to get a product from a clinic that knows far less than you, grown by a person that knows far less than you, sold to you with far much more money than you can afford, given in in, in a consumption method that you often don't necessarily agree with. Obviously, yourself, you said you now vaporize. Yeah. Still, the majority of people combust. And actually, if we look at the evidence, combustion when removed from tobacco, when there isn't that mixture, there is not any correlation anywhere of lung damage because THC is a bronchial dilator and there are other minor cannabinoids, and we're discovering now terpenes as well, that protect the lining of the lungs. Donald Tashkin. Who, sorry? Donald Tashkin. Is that the University, big... University of California? That's probably Don't maybe the study that I'm thinking of. That's his research, yeah. Boom. So the, again, so the, it's starting then to change that narrative. And what I worry here is that, that we've drawn this line arbitrarily. In about late 2017, the system, these capitalists went, holy shit, how much money? Mm-hmm. Right, stop, 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 stop. Right, what can we do? Create this tiny doorway and force everybody through it and make them pay at every step. Change their language, change their culture. Go, if you want to get your prescription, no, 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 no. You can't be out on the streets and representing. You can't wear your bright colors and be pro-cannabis. You've got to go and be respectful and you've got to go be quiet about it. And there's all these articles and this media that's created about how to hide your cannabis and how to, you know, you know, remove yourself and still continue this stigma and internalized shame when all we're doing is the same as smoking a cigarette, frankly. There is no evidence of secondhand consumption, uh, of, of, of uh, getting high from secondhand 
vapor and, and, and combusted smoke. Do you know what I mean? Apart from in like hot box small areas, and even that's that's got second burn from the product, not the second person exhaling it. So if somebody's just having a joint in the back garden, there was no chance of getting high. So all these stories we see in the media of people going, oh, we're all potted up. You see these neighbors complain about cannabis farms and they're saying that the smell makes them nauseous. Sorry, I went on about five different <laughs> subjects there. <laughs> and the question was... <laughs> Just respond to wherever you feel is appropriate. <laughs> well, I think I might uh, have a vape in a sec. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, I, don't, I don't see... I think... I hear you. I really do. And, and I feel the sentiment. I really do. But I, I'm ever the optimist, and I still am. I still am the optimist. I don't think there's these powers at B... That are trying to stop it as such in terms of the way they're that they're not trying to stop it they're trying to own it yeah but I, th- I see it more like a fluid thing like this this door has been created and then the fluid is gone and then gone through and then to the next step and the next step and the next step it's just like it's like it's a lot like, of boat locks it's it's ridiculous but it's inevitable it's like it's, you know what world do we living in like what is the reality that we that we uh Still there? Yeah. Yeah, what is the reality that we live in? See, exactly, I don't even know. Mm. Um, that, and I, I agree that, and I suppose I should separate these conversations, actually, I suppose, because you are an entirely prescription <laughs> cannabis-focused sort of individual. Uh, I'm not. Uh, so we're not entirely. Uh, it, it was more... I'm really not. I'm really not. I, I believe uh, yeah. that cannabis is... is okay, uh, okay um, yeah. That, that, for everyone. Yeah, that probably wasn't the best way of saying that. What I'm trying to say is... Uh, Let's separate these two into two different conversations then. Yeah. So I personally believe, and I've wrote actually for I Smoke Media, shout out uh, Mr. Tyler mm-hmm. Green. Uh, shout out also episode two where you can find a conversation with Tyler. Yeah. You'll include in the links below, folks. Um, I wrote an article saying that the best way, uh, it was around actually 2018, the best way for everybody to get therapeutic access was to allow for ubiquitous um, legal and lawful system. Because then the more cannabis there is, if you could just go to a dispensary, you can go anywhere, you can just get it off Dave and it's not, you've lost all of a sudden the, the, the fear of it. Someone was telling me an anecdote the other day about smoking weed with their, uh, with their elderly mother. And uh, it would, they were, I can't remember where they were, they were in somewhere where it was legal and they were basically going like, you smell weed, the smell weed was like, no, no, it's illegal. It's, it's, not, it's legal here. And this woman who like pigeonholed him and, and stigmatized him for decades of being a cannabis consumer is all of a sudden like, it's legal. Okay, then. And went and enjoyed it and completely was like, this mm. isn't a thing. And it is that, that that mechanism. And I often come back to this podcast of this visualization. At some point, I'm going to stick a video in of this, of the Simpsons, of Homer and Lisa sat in the car and Homer's had his license taken away. And Lisa goes, Dad, you can't drive. Uh, they've taken your license. And Homer goes, oh, I'll try anyway. And he tries to start the car and it works. And so he drives. And I think that is the same cognitive block in most people's heads that they could now go and buy the uh, hydroponic equipment, uh, sorry, equipment from a hydroponic shop. They go and buy the seed now and within three months have a wonderful crop. But the, 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 the first hurdle there is this legality, that fear. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so that fear is, is then played on as a marketing t- tool by this system. And they go, oh, you want to be safety, yeah? Do you want to drive safety and be legal and not get caught up because the driving system means you've got your paper, you're not going to get caught. Whereas if you then consumed even two days ago as a heavy consumer and didn't consume, but you could then fail a drug, uh, a drug swab and then have a high blood sample. So it's this, this paradox that the, the legal route creates safety and security predicated on the fact that the non-legal stuff is somehow dangerous. But how is it okay to drive stoned on prescription, but not without? Why is it okay? It's, it's, it's education and it's because the powers that be don't understand and they're still in the prohibition paradigm and, you know, medical cannabis. Oh, I'll challenge you on that one. Prescription it, cannabis. Prescription <laughs> cannabis. Prescription <laughs> cannabis mm-hmm. at the moment. It's just a little, neat, a little yeah. hole. It's, it's not a big thing. It's literally just like a little plaster, a little solution mm-hmm. for a few people to not live in fear. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like, that's 15,000 people not living in fear of prohibition. Like mm-hmm. there was everyone, every patient lived in fear of prohibition when I started. Everyone. True. True. So, so how, you know, how, how I can't do we expand see it as, I can't see it as a negative thing. I can see it as a positive. I can say 100% with certainty it's far too slow. It's far too difficult. The quality is inferior. And 
it's ridiculous that we're still in this paradigm where we have to pretend for to prescription and non-prescription or whatever, because all cannabis is medicine, whether it's prescription or non-prescription, it makes my life better. So what's the difference really? Yeah. So could, would one of the, I suppose, will my question's all in a jumble here. I love it yeah. when shows like this occur. It's wicked because uh, it means I don't actually have to go. Uh, well, the next question is, yeah. Um, but yes. Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to discuss, I suppose, um, with the the Renaissance, the breathing into life again, and the rebirth of the uh, U- UPA. Mm-hmm. Could one of the things, and I, I don't know what your policies are, but I'm just going to go. Here you go. Take this one. Take this one. Take this one. Quite quite aggressively, but but with with love. Um, <laughs> Could it be a system of self-identification then? Because if these people hit the qualifying criteria and can get the piece of paper, but don't want to have to pay, they're then paying three, four, five hundred pounds a month for bud that a lot of them don't use. They just want the paper and the packaging to then put their own product in. Can we not use the existing system to somehow create that as then going, well, all right, I go to a doctor. Yeah, you should be allowed this. And and. If I don't get it. It's, this is obviously where CanCard and other systems yeah. try and fill the gaps, but they're not prove it, proven, as we've seen with that recent court case in uh, the Isle of Wight. You know, the the home office, uh, the CPS didn't accept it. Um, granted, the the guy only got fined like 40, 50 quid, whatever it was, but the point was it was tested, and that's still not, even though he hit the criteria, but he didn't yeah. have the piece of paper, and it wasn't the right flower. And I think that's the paradigm that a lot of people are rebelling against. I myself, yes, see small victories in this, but I'm also of the, the larger paradigm that I myself am considered a therapeutic consumer. And I, but I am stigmatized by my healthcare provider because I don't have legitimate usage of it. So they won't then follow th- certain therapeutic routes because of my illicit cannabis consumption. But I don't want a doctor involved with my relationship with cannabis. I don't need a doctor involved in my relationship with cannabis. I just don't want to fear the police for having cannabis on me, for being around cannabis, for growing cannabis, you know? I think that's, that is the root and the main point of my introduction and why I wanted to do this is because I hate living in fear. Like, you know what it's like, and I've, I've seen your previous podcast and you've spoken about this, when you see the blue light, right? Or you see a policeman approaching your property or you're out and you need to medicate, but there's, police there and then you can't you know that fear that having to look over your shoulder like it's fucked like frankly it's fucked and it's wrong and i see this as a as a niche way a niche solution to that to remove some of that fear like we we're going to go on to this so I'll, I'll 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 go i'll go there but with my with my son you know i have a son now he's two um, and unfortunately he was, he was really ill. So yeah, he, he was born and he was born with a blockage in his small intestine. So they had to, haven't actually spoken about this yet. So bear with me because, okay. yeah. Um, so he had a blockage in his small intestine and it was life threatening. So they had to operate. Right. Um, straight away mm. and then he had a stoma so he had his you know he had a little bit and coming out of his stomach so he pooed out of his stomach for his first three and a half months um my partner she didn't have the birth experience that she wanted let's put it that way she didn't have she had it in fact she had the opposite she had the birth experience she dreaded yeah and uh mm. man that is it was hard yeah it sounds it was really hard unbelievably so it's... and then so then she she unfortunately was diagnosed with postnatal depression mm. Fucking hell, man. it's literally everything that every new parent fears in one clusterfuck. So, and, yeah. where have I been? Well, mm. I've been prioritizing, man. That's it's what humans do, you know what I mean? Reproduce and raise families. I've been with my family. Yeah. I don't think anyone can blame you for that. I really can't. It's one of the reasons why when I reached out to you, I, I 
respected the dialogue and the discourse that we've had leading to this because it's this is an important recording and conversation but i've understood and respected the you know for, for those that choose family family comes first it always has to like i didn't i didn't know what that was so you know i first started campaigning in 2010 like i was diagnosed with ms in 2010 boom there it is have it and i first started campaigning and i just I don't know. I'd never thought I'd have a child. I never thought I'd be in a position to like be safe. You know, mm. I, I wouldn't want to bring a child in the into the world where there's a threat of me being removed from them, where there's the fear of the law. Yeah, I might I might have this bit here, but you know, there's I've got a can card and I've got my prescription, so you know, I'm I'm in a comfortable position where I feel okay. Um, mm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I suppose that's the added, the added pressures. Again, it's something that I often take for granted, but try to speak of when I'm humbly reminded, I guess, of it in that I have no dependence. My life is my work, I guess, in a lot of ways. And, um, yeah, I, I entirely, as I've said, respect your position. And I, 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 I would like to hope that anybody that's watching this, obviously we're going to go on to discuss, what happened with, with the EPA and the other work busy leading on from 2010. But I do hope that then this conversation and exactly what you, you said there, and thank you for sharing it and for, yeah. for being so open and, and vulnerable. I think that's something we need to see more of in this world is, is the raw truth because that is what drives us. You know what I mean? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to come back and I wasn't ready to be a presence in the community for good. I mean, a lot happened with the EPA I'm sure we'll onto it as well, but I, I didn't want to come back and spit hatred and be like, mm. this person, that person, rah, 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 rah. And if I'd come back before now, that's where that's where it would have gone with me. Like I, I know myself well enough to know that sometimes it's hard for me to get over things that happen mm. and I, I will get over it and I will forgive and forget and whatever, but sometimes I find that harder and you know, I didn't. I didn't want to come back aggressively hating on others. I wanted to come back in a way that I could say, you know what, hands up. It didn't go perfectly. It, yeah. it, what's happened? That that wasn't the plan. That was not the plan. And I had no intention of stepping down for two years. My intention was to take six months out. Yeah was intending to take six months out to have my baby i did a decade of campaigning a decade and i was like you know what i'm having a baby i'm going to take six months out and then the pandemic happened everything happened as it has and it's just meant that it's been two years now it's been over two years since i've been in the industry in the campaigning scene and my son's just turned two so you know i've got to spend although it's been hard ridiculously hard um, I've got to spend so much time with him. I'm blessed. I see the blessings in that. Like, I'm so lucky. I'm I'm really sorry that people feel let down. And if I was sat in other people's shoes or other people's positions, I'm sure I would feel the same because, you know, there were a lot of promises made. And we had, I certainly had the best intentions of fulfilling those promises, but that's why I'm back. You know, I'm a man of my word. It might take me a bit longer than most people, but I've got MS. Like, it takes me longer than everyone to do everything. So yeah. I've not given up. I've not, I'm not giving in. This is not enough. This is not good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking about that when I'm coming back. I'm going to be talking about the quality of this. I'm going to be talking about how machine-trimmed, with you know, with little bits of stalk and badly cured, badly dried, it, stuff it, it irradiated, yeah, irradiated, stuck in a plastic pot means that this is a very inferior product to nearly everything on the on the black market right now. You know, nearly everything. I've not, in fact, I've not had anything worse on the black market in Brighton for ever, ever. Yeah, I mean, even ever. Yeah, in Reading, I did when I lived in Reading, but not in not in Brighton. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the uh, no, we'll circle back to packaging. We'll circle back. Right. I want to let's go chronologically because we said, right. Yeah. So we started 20, 2010. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe the first organization you got involved with was Legalized Cannabis Alliance. Uh, so, no, for, so I 
So 2010, I was diagnosed with MS. The first organization I got involved with was the Berkshire MS Therapy Center. So my personal background in history and also why, why I believe I'm the right person to continue to help lead this movement forward. I am a leader, not the leader, because we need to all respect each other's leadership qualities. And, but I am a leader in this movement. Um, and I've forgotten what I was talking about because cannabis has got some side effects sometimes that mean trail of thought goes yeah. and then you get sidetracked. And then I just like the cool bridge in the background of your uh, yeah. pictures. And obviously Product Earth is great. Yeah. All good comments. Uh, Berkshire MS Society. Yeah, That's MS Society. It's MS, uh, MS. So I went there. I was getting help there. First diagnosed, like I was consuming cannabis. Um, it was helping me a lot. Um, I decided to do, because I before I was ill, I was a vocalist in the metal band. Like we did some tours and like that was my passion. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to do like a, a metal gig, a metal festival to raise money for the MS centre because they were there for me when I was diagnosed and being diagnosed with MS. <laughs> Awful. So my history with them is like my mum as well. My mum uh, was their treasurer for 20 years and then my stepdad um, helped them a lot. So it was kind of like it was in the family, you know? And then, so I did this MS, I called it MS of all. And um, because they were, yeah, I know. And then um, I'll probably relaunch that idea again at some point, but because the MS charity was like all really well connected to all the local um, radio and papers and all of that, they asked me to go on to talk about this. And so this is start of 20, no, end of 2010, end of 2010. I'm going on, uh, maybe start of 2011. Mike, I'm not quite sure it's between the two. But yeah, I went, so I went on BBC Radio Berkshire just to promote, with my mum as well, with my mum, me and my mum talking about MS in the family and what it was like to be a young carer because I had two parents with MS growing up. So mm. they were like, oh, what was this like? And they just, and just said to me, okay, so how do you cope? What, how do you cope with the pain? You've described this pain, though, the MS hug, it sounds horrible. What do you do? And, you know, I can't lie. I'm a very bad liar. I wear my heart on my sleeve and my honesty and honest, you know, I just said live on BBC radio, but oh yeah, yeah. I just take cannabis. Yeah. I, I consume cannabis. It really helps me. And then they're like, Whoa. And then basically cause uproar in the, in the, in the MS charity. They're like, Whoa, I was, I was going to a trustee meetings. I was lined up to be their youngest ever uh, trustee. But I was really like pushing like for it. And they were like, oh no, you can't, you can't come here anymore. And uh, well, you can come here. You're welcome here. But if we suspect that you have cannabis on you, we will be calling the police, which is basically you can't come here anymore, isn't it? Yeah. So I was just like, well, fuck you then. I'm going to go start my own MS organization called Action for MS. And then I'm going to go campaign about how cannabis should be legal for people with MS. And that's the first organization that I founded. And that led me to the Legalized Cannabis Alliance and Chris Baldwin and a few of the other old activists uh, that Chris Baldwin it was one of my my mentors who I learned so much from led me to them and then you know the rest as they say is history yeah yeah wow well rest in peace Chris did a, a hell of a lot of work for uh for the UK community <clears throat> mm -hmm. um yeah I just want to kind of articulate the meme that was made in my head of Bender yeah. from Futurama with screw you, I'm going to go make my own MS charity with blackjack and huggers, but with cannabis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. So you then obviously you met Chris and others. Then yeah. I suppose around this time, there was uh, other organizations forming other people were starting to sort of come onto the scene. Well, um, well, yeah, I'd say no names, but somebody took over the Legalized Cannabis Alliance and held a vote to change its name. Uh, and then the board, the former board of the Legalized Cannabis Alliance tried to remove that person for alleged, I'm not sure if I can say allegedly, because I believe they've been proven in court and he's, and he's lost. So I think I can say that they are racist, but I might say that they're allegedly racist just in case. 
uh, allegedly racist blogs and we tried to remove him. Uh, and then he basically, because he, it was to his address, he refused and he went against the, against the vote, uh, controlled the board and moved on. And uh, so myself, um, Greg, UK, uh, Greg DeHoot, uh, Stuart Harper, Joe Martin, and a few other people went on to go, do you know what? We are going to do something different. Greg had good links with normal US, so we decided, okay, we'll start the normal UK chapter. And that that happened as a and that happened as a direct result. Everything I've done has basically been a fuck you to someone telling me I can't do it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, pretty much. Um, yeah. So that's another uh, example of that. Uh, and then, and then uh, there was normal UK founded. And then UK CSC came in around the same time. I founded a, a local group called the Berkshire Cannabis Community. Oh, and it was quite- I introduced that is the wrong name in the start there. Sorry about that, folks. I think I said Berkshire. Oh, uh, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's all right. But yeah, I, I founded that group and that was kind of like one of the first, I think it was one of the first, if, if not the first um, clubs, UK CSE clubs that later turned into the UK CSE anyway, that kind of popped up organically. We were certainly the most active at the beginning. Um, I think we had maybe like seven or eight different meetings with talks and events happening like before any of the other clubs started to do that. So we really kind of pushed ahead and set the, set the direction of what the clubs would become. I then, I then became like the South, the UK CSC South uh, coordinator. So working with Greg to try and set up clubs in the South of the country, um, kind of had my own, my, my own free reign to do whatever I wanted in the South basically. So a load of other clubs started organically popping up, which is found finding people in different areas being like, Hey, we need a club here. Hey, we need a club there. Hey, we need a club here. Like, and just getting them together and, and doing it. And there was a lot of crossover between the normal UK, uh, people and the UK CSC people. Um, and then for whatever reason, I'm not going to go into it because I'm here to spread the love, not the hate, but for whatever reason, there was disagreements within, the board of the of normal and UK CSC. I had a medical agenda. I was wanted to focus on the medical side. I was kind of knocked back and said, no, no, no. So I said, well, I'm going to go and do that then. Sorry, but that's what I believe. I firmly believe from my experience, from where I've been and what I've seen and the people I've met, that this is the way that we're going to win this war. Because this is a war. Remember, war on drugs. No, there's no drugs involved. It's war on people, and we're and we're the soldiers on the ground right now. Yep. Just because I've got this legally doesn't mean I'm not fighting anymore. It means I'm fighting from a more strategic, better position. Mm-hmm. I'm not giving up. I won't give up. This is my life. Yeah. I first experienced cannabis as a child, not taking it myself, but seeing it. So my my stepfather, Richard, he had quite severe progressive MS. I moved in with him when I was five. And by the time that I was 11, uh, they'd taken him. But I saw cannabis work. Mm -hmm. I saw him have a better life. You know, he, he was really smart and this where it's where it's why I fool people and they think I'm middle class when I'm actually working class from a council or state in Slough. But, you know, that's why I fool people because he had this education and he was just so, so loving and caring and he taught me so much. But he, he was a, a nuclear physicist. So he worked for, wow. yeah, he worked for the UKAEA, Atomic Energy Association. He worked in research and development at Banbury. So he was like, of well, you know, he, he had a astute, sharp mind. And um his his company that he worked for, they they wanted him there so much that even when he could only use his chin, so he got so he got so ill at the point he could literally just move his chin and that was it. He still he's got his wheelchair, he set it up, had his lever here, and he's still like mm, going into work. Do uh, research on physics, yeah. <laughs> you know, and he'd be exhausted, and he'd come home, and he'd be like, oh, and then he'd go outside into the garage, 
smoke a joint, maybe two or three. And then he'd come back in and then he was present again. He was my stepfather again. You know, he was himself. That smell of cannabis for me is very nostalgic because it reminds me of him. It reminds me of going and catching it. I caught him. So he tried to, you know, he tried to like keep it away from me, I guess. You know, in the 90s, there's a lot of stigma and wasn't accepted at all. But he was so ill that I caught him basically. And I was like, no. I was a little, you can imagine, I was a little goody to <laughs> you, you can't smoke, you, you can't smoke, the smoking's bad for you. <laughs> little trying to cry, but crying because I was uh, worried about him. And he's like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. It's, this is not, this is not tobacco, this is not cigarettes, this is my medicine, this is different, this is a look, it's green, it's not great, it's not, you know, this is or whatever. And so, like, I learned from him, I saw from him, you know. You, I think I must have been seven when I first encountered him doing that and whatever. And yeah, he consumed up until up until he died. It was so important to him, in fact, that he had a handyman come round and install a joint holder in the garage wall that was on a was on a hinge so that my mum could undo the hinge. My mum could put a joint in the in the joint holder and then he could just wheel up and then it was the exact height and then he could he just like lit it with one of those big lights you know the big like gas lighter thing he just mm-hmm. could put it down and then yeah and that's how we medicate it was so important to him that he 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 would made sure that he could do it basically i remember he used to just get like big bags of joints as well like someone used to like deliver him like instead of it in in little bits, I mean, he used to just start rolling, start rolling it for, for him because he couldn't, because he couldn't anymore. And he used to so like mm-hmm. every few weeks get a big bag of drinks. It's so funny. Now I look back, it's so funny. But yeah, I, I learned. I, you know, I learned. You absorb all of that. Yeah. Now I can't. I couldn't not see my stepfather being well. I'm like, he's ill. He can't talk to you. He can't even close his eyes when he sleeps. That's how little control he's got. He sleeps with his eyes open, like. Mm. that's how little control he's got over his body yeah he when he has this medicine when he goes into the garage when he smokes on this on this contraption thing that he set up he comes back in he's like oh hi how's you know oh yeah i had a good day oh yeah let's watch this let's watch this program about history oh you know i want to listen to some music clark can you make can you put on my music please can you put on this cd for me i really want to hear these songs whatever like queen and pink floyd and all sorts of amazing music that I was like lying there, like, whoa, you know, yeah, experiencing that with him. So mm. it's intrinsically in me that this is medicine. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. It, exa- yeah. It's like, it's great to hear. And I think a lot of people will really respect and appreciate the, your personal motivators and the, the reasons um, f- as to why you, you campaign. And I think it's really, uh, great that we touched on earlier why there has been this uh, this hiatus, this res- respite, and it's been entirely that yeah. necessity. If exactly, we've touched yeah. on a brief amount of what you've done over that that decade of of activism and work, yeah. and I think few people seem to remember or stay humble of the concept of each generation or each iteration of activism is formed on the back mm-hmm. of the previous generations. It's, well, I'm standing always, on the shoulder of giants. Entirely that, entirely that. And it is this this concept that the reason I fight the way I fight is I feel obligated to every individual that has ever opened their mouth, Mm -hmm. that has ever dared to rebel against that system, that has planted that seed in defiance, not in an act of going, I'm going to get a Rolex and two BMWs or whatever else, but it's just a, I'm going to become self-sufficient. I'm going to learn what I can about this planet. I'm going to develop a relationship with it. And I feel obligated anytime I do any work, any activism to try to represent the broadest spectrum. And I think this conversation goes quite well to highlight to people, including myself, why there is an importance for champions, for leadership within just the prescription, can- I could, as we call it now, the prescription cannabis sort of sector, community, industry. But I think that there has to then be this to twinned with leadership within an adult consumption movement because they have to work in tandem. What I'm seeing at the minute or we need you is, is, is yeah what well, we need you. That's I'm trying I'm happy to take up some mantles and try some things here. Yeah. But so I think that 
we see one of the things that I'm seeing that is is quite painful to me is the weaponization of stories like your own mm. to serve an agenda to then go well right we're a giant corporation that just so happened to set up a think tank that just so happened to invest in this lobbyist firm that happened to invest in this law firm and do this and just so happened to then go well here's fifty people and oh ten of them are children and oh put all these together and here's the script here's the whatever and massage and create a narrative and now I've just seen that it's now on acid to quote like the nineties term of it's just gone a bit crazy mm -hmm. in that now you've got people who are benefiting and had benefited from the legacy industry and market and from illegal access and still currently getting no, not illegal unlawful. I think is the correct way of describing it mm -hmm. currently still gaining from unlawful access, but then because of the need to get the prescription and then because of the, I don't want to say gaslighting, but the one strict narrative that's being perpetuated by all these healthcare professionals at all these different levels, that they're actually seeing that they can't go back to this legacy and are now becoming champions against it. And I feel that there needs to be, in, in a, not necessarily an opposing force, but a balancing force on the other side that then the people that, like your father, that might not, your stepfather, sorry, that might not have wanted to have that intervention, granted at the time, actually you'd be a perfect candidate for a, a, a compassion yeah. network of somebody to come around. But there are other individuals that I imagine through humility and a sense of, of I don't say egoism, but of self-preservation and of identification don't want someone involved. That's their thing. They've developed this, this relationship, that entity goes into the garage to medicate, to, to be in that world to, to then, you know, once he's then, being part of that to then share that with others watching the the historical programs listening to music sharing that with yourself and with, with his partner your mom um and i think that we need to res respect that that there needs to be another element to it that can't be dealt with you can't prescribe go listen to pink floyd no. develop your own little cave <laughs> in your own system put your own posters <laughs> up develop a nice we can't the culture needs to transfer. There is a huge Venn diagram of the just, fuck it, I'm going to roll a seven-foot joint and smoke it in a park, and the, the strictly, I'm only going to use it if I can get it prescribed, and I don't care what it looks like, I have to yeah. consume it because that's the only one I've got. In the middle is all of that knowledge and wealth of experience that can build a system that allows, all right, you've got that prescription, come with us to this wonderful cultural place you can consume it. All right, you can't afford a prescription. Come to this compassion network where you can get access. You know they're never they're not going to prescribe. Yeah, because as you know, as you know, as you well know, nowhere gets all of those things at the same time. You know that you've been there. You've but seen we, it. But we can champion and fight for the one. The... We yeah. can, but it's like I don't. I just think right. it's just really. It's just where are we in the world? Where do we live? What is the culture, the predominant culture of the place that we live? How do the normal people think and act every day? And unfortunately, conversations that we're having now are so far ahead of where the majority of the population are. I just don't think that we're going to be able to get all of these things at once. I think, and this is my opinion, and I know that lots of people disagree with me and 100% there's definitely merit in, in other options, but I really think getting behind and redefining what medical cannabis is, cannabis, prescription cannabis, prescription cannabis <laughs> medical cannabis, you know, yeah. re redefining that, ensuring that's enshrined in all of the organizations that are working together, right? And then moving forward, I think that is our, our strongest front right now. We have won. They're on the back foot. Yeah, they're all scram scrambling behind the scenes trying to make money. Now they're but like, what? They're like, whoa, it's happened. How the hell can we stall this so that we can get everything in place so that we control the entire industry? And what's happened with the movement is that we the pandemic has just kind of shut us all down. There's no one out there championing this that it needs to be different anymore. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. And that's why I'm coming back. And that's why I'm coming to you. And that's why I'm reaching out to the pre previous people that may have fallen out with and people that honestly I don't really want to work with, but the greater cause is that we need to knock our heads together and realize that it doesn't matter. He said, he said, she said, they said that back in the past doesn't matter. We need to draw a line in the sand and we need to recognize and realize that if we consume cannabis, be it, be it prescription cannabis, be it legacy cannabis, 
whatever the, the if we're consuming cannabinoids photocannabinoids from the plant whatever the source of those photocannabinoids that has therapeutic potential and that can improve people's lives and that can improve our society so that's what we really need to focus on and that's where i think the sharpest point is um and you know i'm 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 annoyed that i haven't been around i wanted to be there i wanted to be saying this stuff i wanted to be doing it but family has to come first i had to i had to look out for my partner i had to look out for my son yeah no i get, I get that um so on, on the point there i think yeah. i yeah i agree in one way but also i am very much to use the common parlance of our age triggered by the idea of going support medical first and we'll get you later. Cause that's, we, we yeah. heard that in, we heard that in 2017. Yeah. So what I would actually state then now is if we're looking at what's unrealistic, there is no way in hell the establishment and the law and the legislation that stands today is going to allow any patient to grow their own. There is too many variables where that spills over into the illicit criminal market. There is too many exposure points to children and all of the other sensationalist arguments that they're going to generate. Whereas I think there is ultimate sincere merit in the in the human rights argument of this. That actually, this culture has moved on far more than you would think. More people in this country take cocaine than you can imagine. It's now that the, the drugs have spilled into all levels and classes. The reason that they're looking at different, now they're calling them depenalization schemes because they're scared to say de facto decriminalization, which is what it actually is. Yeah. They're not understanding their own language. They're diluting the argument in the conversation. They're trying to say face, aren't they? There's the the prohibition, exactly. prohibition is in its death throes and it's trying to say face. Like it's dying. So, so we need to give them it's, the, it's, it's only a matter of time. If we wanna if we want it to be the way we want it, if you want it that way and I want it this way, I think both of those things are possible at the same time. And if we support each other and we help each other, that's that's we recognize saying, yeah. that actually you know, maybe we don't agree on every single little detail, but if we're all pushing for this plant, the plant, mm -hmm. remember that's the, we're just the messengers, we, the plant that we're fighting for. If we're all pushing for the plant, then we're all get there. We're, it's hard, you know, I have these grand visions and I like really, because, you know, you've, you've been there, you've seen it. And it's like, you see it, you live it, you, you go to a place where, is kind of like so much better than it is where you're from, where you live. And you're like, whoa, I need this to be what it is back home. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, it's nowhere near. But, yeah. you know, you, I've got a lot of friends in California and the point that I think is, is necessary to make as well is that capitalism isn't, capitalism isn't going to protect the patient. It's not designed to, but it's not going to protect the consumer either. It's going to roll no. over the industry, eat it alive. Look at what okay. happened with vaporization. A harm reduction tool for reduction of cigarette consumption is in and of itself become an entire industry. Mm -hmm. Look at the marketing, the regulation. Look at the ubiquitous positioning of it in any town, city center, up and down the country. It's now created a first stop market for people to just vaporize, getting exposed to nicotine, creating life, lifelong customers. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying about trusting the same systems. Look at British American Tobacco. Look at Philip Morris. Look Look at what is it nine out of ten of the major alcohol uh, beer manufacturers in the world look at uh, the, the wine country people look at the, there's all these different huge sectors that have jumped in and are investing and throwing all this money and creating all of this warped language all of this marketing gimmicks and all of this misinformation of like oh cbd is non-psychoactive or that cbd is good thc is bad that hemp is a fucking thing all of these yeah. these things that they're yeah. just trying to well, create to, sub, to, 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 to subdivide us what about skunk you forgot skunk that's we, the biggest one well skunk skunk actually yeah i'm trying still and i'm probably saying this out loud now on the podcast probably gonna hamper it I'm, I'm sorry mags but i am trying to get drug science to get me uh sit down with david nutt because in his latest book, he still speaks of and quotes skunk, which is colloquially termed in academia in the UK as 14% THC, less than 2% CBD. That the majority of the product that is now being prescribed in the UK is classifiable as skunk. Yet there is no argument for psychosis. Mike Barnes has said on this podcast twice, the entire profession does not worry about psychosis. I've seen a recent screenshot from a doc, uh, I, can't even, I don't know where my phone is. I've seen a screenshot literally this morning from a presentation uh, from one of the associations in the UK that I'm not going to name. And it basically stating that medicinalization is the only way to prevent psychosis. They're stating that psychosis is created from yeah. cannabis in the illicit market because it isn't legal. 
it's an insane. Remember, 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 like where we live. Remember the headlines. Remember, like only a few weeks ago, there's cannabis edible kills. You know, it wasn't cannabis edible. But like, yeah. I agree with you, but like you've got to look at it in the context in which it's in, right? So, skunk is our biggest enemy in terms of the the rhetoric like it's been the the skunk madness the reefer madness is that's the reefer madness of our generation that's what's used to justify prohibition to justify continuing the budget and to justify not letting patients access it that that is the root of it that's what the fallback is so i would argue as a community we don't need to be bickering amongst each other about what way should we do it. Rah, 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 rah. We just need to go, okay, that's the biggest enemy, that misinformation that is out there about this, that paradigm that they've created that turns people that consume cannabis into crazies, you know, that is our enemy. That is the root of where all of this is coming from. And that is why the language used by a lot of these people, you've got to remember a lot of these people in these in, in these businesses in these industries they have a similar experience you know they have found the plant works them and you know we've got inside men a lot of places and we don't realize how powerful we are they have to often use this language for it to be accepted by the powers that be right and it creates small incremental change and they do that because if they use the language that we know is correct and that we know is right and the terminology that is the truth, fully in the truth. It won't be accepted. It will be laughed at. It will be thrown out, and then no progress will be made. But, but what's be, but what's occurring there is entirely that they are creating an entire generation of consumers that are apathetic and uninformed. Mm. If we're running around going cannabis strains, cannabis strains, mm. it's wrong. The cultivars, chemovars. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's even the same legal, lawful. That is a huge huge difference in terms of when you understand legalese in terms of using medical rather than sort of prescriptions using the terms like recreational marijuana or yeah. hemp even all of these they've created an entire dictionary and a glossary of terms to beguile us to hypnotize us and to get us to go well if you want your little thing come with us we'll get your little step along the way what are those steps building to? They're building to a ubiquitous international conglomerative system similar to food similar to any big agriculture mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You can grow wheat and whatever else in, in your garden and, and whatnot, but if you want to grow on a larger scale and create a part of the industry, you are never getting your foot in the door. The pay-to-play systems of the licensing, the corruption within regulations of institutions of lobbying, these have already had billions invested in the UK. There's 15,000 patients, as we spoke of before. There's more than 50 million pounds gone through investment in the London Stock Exchange in the past two years alone. Yeah, so yeah, it, you're not wrong. It, you're, you are right, but this is happening anyway. This is going to happen because so we know, can we but we they've got these people and these this money and this institution yeah. we've got the fucking people clock yeah. if you or I for example let's speak hypothetically if you or I lead the two causes as it were in unity understanding that actually through a sharing of information an actual standardization and a ubiquitous respect we could build a model that is inclusive of each yes there may be incremental yeah. steps that involve that but the point would be that each part would protect and, and serve the whole. In doing that, you would unify those 1.4 million uh, medicinal consumers in the UK and however many other recreational consumers. Then you could also get all of the CBD consumers, all the people that are just, oh, it's in my shampoo, it's in my toothpaste. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the education is far more advanced and the awareness and culture, I think, is far more advanced than it was a few, few years ago, mm -hmm. to give credit to the system. I mean, you walk into an average supermarket or an average shop, the leaf is everywhere, and they still don't know what they're doing. They're putting on the back of the products from hemp seed oil. This is illegal when you look at trading standards. They have to put the botanical source. It has to be italized uh, in italics and state that it's cannabis sativa uh, L. And you've then got products where they're going, oh, well, this is from hemp again, which they're showing then an indica leaf. So they're misrepresenting the, yeah. the branding. They don't understand the taxonomy of the plant. Whereas again, we can create that standardization of education. If the consumer demands, yeah. hey, that product's wrong, send a, a message to the, con uh, to the consumer bureau or to the trading standards or to the company themselves. And if we demand better as consumers, we will get better. If we continue to allow for another campaign and another system where we just ask for what we think they'll give us, they'll only give us what they'll think we'll get.
yeah, if that sentence hey, made any sense. I hear you. I hear you. I totally hear you. I think it's important to clarify and re-clarify what the UPA's aims, goals, and mission were, and just to just to like recognize that rescheduling cannabis was number one goal aim, right? Mm. But grow your own is also our main one of our main aims we have a whole page or we had when we had a website hope there will be one again soon but when we had a website we had a whole page on our let us grow campaign i don't like the terminology greg's right to grow is actually better so maybe i'll speak to him about potentially borrowing it because he should let me right because it's for the cause but it's i prefer the right to grow as as a as a saying than let us grow but we did run a specific grow your own campaign in 2016 the appg did a report the appg appg on drug reform did a report on medical cannabis it was written by professor mike barnes it also included a the upa survey uh, where we basically showed that patients want to grow their own and as a result of our survey being in in that report the third recommendation of that report the first was to reschedule and the third recommendation was to allow patients to grow their own. Um, we will always fight for grow your own. I can't pretend like I've not done that in the past. I can't pretend that I am not from that. That's, that's who I am. That's what I had to do to survive. And that's what so many people out there have to do to survive is it something you would do if you could, if your child and your home wasn't put in jeopardy by the law? Um, it's something I want to do. It's something I long to do. It's something that it gives me a lot of, because because it's not just, so it, the, the growing of it, it's not just about like the medicine at the end of it or whatever. It's There's a huge therapeutic potential in actually being with those plants every day and seeing the changes, seeing the development and the patience it teaches you because... If you're in a hurry, you can't do it right. As we have learned, if you're in a hurry, you can't do it right. So, you know, that love and that, you know, the plant, plants are, are sentient beings. They, they, they have more awareness than we give them credit for. And when they're grown with love and when they're grown with attention and when in small batch, you know, when each plant has several hours worth of time, in a week, every single plant has that from a person. They're different. They they respond to that. Like you, you, you know. I loved I loved just going in and like you know just doing taking all the little bits off the bottom, like lollipopping, making sure that it's just the, the canopy at the top has got all the main, you know, all those little nuanced things that you learn when you grow about you know about the the lights and the the environment and the fans and the, all the, all the things that you know I, ha- I literally had to do had to do it to survive yeah. had to yeah did it give you because one of the things that i found um is it give me a m- much more of a deeper appreciation of nature of just yeah. the natural world in general like and yeah i think we've touched it before the again to go back to memes because i always reference memes because that's yeah. how my, my brain apparently works um from is it peep show and i can't remember the name of the the guy uh hans or something hans. Call him? and he's uh he's the secret in Hello, brighton resident super the, hans yeah super hans that's his name and uh, yeah every now and again the um what does he say the secret ingredient is crime yeah. and like so i think there's something about taking responsibility and autonomy and this is what i mean about i don't want a doc i'm happy to go and tell a doctor about my relationship with yeah. cannabis and yeah. have that measured against my health i've not lied about my drug use when i went and did that documentary about lsd with the bbc mm-hmm. i went to my doctor and kind of went can you can you put this on my notes because i'm a little scared the police are going to knock on my door and if i end up with a problem with this i'd quite like some sort of support and after like to and fro with them my gp ultimately put on my notes uh, Mr. Carter believes that his microdosing of LSD, and it was, yeah, it was the belief thing, but it was just kind of enough. And so I've the same. I've always tried to be honest with my, my relationship, but I think that trying to tell a doctor that my plant tastes better with love, it's better for me. You know, the terpenes are not damaged, you know, talking about all these nuances about the plant and, and how these things work to a doctor who's going, no, but CBD ratio this to THC yep, ratio yep. that, go. That's, I've told that works. It's what, if it's not working for you, I've yeah. heard this, I've heard this from high up in the industry, the, yeah. the, the prescribed cannabis industry. I feel that, well, maybe it's just not for you. 
maybe you're expecting too much and your your experience of the illegal market has tainted your expectation of the medication. I fucking heard that out of the mouth of one of these people. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, not everyone thinks that. You know, we're always gonna. There's always gonna be naysayers. There's always gonna be people against. This is this is where we are actually gonna be good to work together because I need someone like you with this ability to go to look at it, like really look at the problems and really go deep and go, you know what? Like, not the bigger picture. What about these little things here? What about that? And what about that? And what about that? Like, uh, I'm all about the little things. I've made a, I've made a career as a little thing. Me, you need my eternal optimism because I we have, think I'm we, we have, you are optimistic. You are, I'll give you that. Okay. Yeah, but I was going to say I'm fighting, so I've got to be fighting. We, we, if we work together, <laughs> I think people will listen to us. And so, as I say, I think we are, it's two sides of the same coin when it's, it is. It, it, it's not necessary that it even has, it's, I'm not saying I've tried to really go, bridge the gulfs and to get rid of these false polarizations and these binary divides that have been created within our industry over the past couple of years. And for all I don't, if we speak of it, that there are people that will firmly only see themselves right now in one camp. Yeah. But in 10, 20 years when the war is over, we will all understand that there was no difference, really. And that whatever systems we gain access, when all of the available routes are there, there's every coffee shop, there's every club, you can grow whatever you want, trade on a farmer's market on a Sunday, sell it at a car booty, buy it at Tesco, all the rest of it, when we're at that position, the healing will truly begin and have, and have really be working in society. But I, I agree that some of my ideas and concepts are, I think, are are for that point, but I'm I'm still young. I'm only 34 this year. I'm happy to fight until I'm 60, 70 yeah. if it means that the generations that fall before me yeah. are never afraid of that blue light exactly. and, and, and never put into poverty because of their choice of culture or the way they express themselves. Do you know what I mean? And I think I, I agree. There is a great deal of middle ground in that Venn diagram for the prescription world and the uh, the legacy, legacy yeah. I think is the best way to describe the ubiquity of that mm -hmm. other side for us to, to come together mm -hmm. and eventually there will be no sides but we need well, to you, as you, you said have, represent you, you've that seen my talks we i remember actually a few times we've gone and we've been on the same lineup at the same event or whatever and we're giving talks mm -hmm. basically the opposite side of things you're like no we must focus on everyone and i'm like no we must just focus on medical and actually if we realize that's the same coin the, the divide is the side of the coin that we are on well, we it's, just it's recognize almost, that it's almost the same but different yeah it's using the language uh, what well, I always was. argue. I remember, <laughs> I remember you're in the audience, and I said, "I don't believe in recreational cannabis. Mm. There's no such thing. What is recreation?" Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I, I, I caught you from that. That was in the crowd at the uh, premiere, I think, of the grassroots in Ireland, because yeah. I think I've quoted you a few times on this podcast since of saying that you stood up and you said that, "Well, I get pain relief, but I also get enjoyment." Yeah. So it was, yeah. So I, it was then, it was, it was, it was during a contentious time when a yeah. lot of people were throwing around this idea that all cannabis is medical, which yeah. it isn't, but it is. All cannabis is medicinal because yeah. medicinal means the therapeutic use of. Mm -hmm. Medical under current nomenclature and the understanding of the establishment means that it has to go through a prescription, mm -hmm. pharmacy, it has to be owned by pharmaceutical companies, research development, patented, single use, go through, triple blind studies, all the rest of that crap. Whereas what we're just advocating is anybody can get any form of therapeutic use because it's measurable that the cannabinoids, even the terpenes, will have the, that measurable effect on, on, the, on the body. We all need a little bit of homeostasis. Exactly. And that's, again, something that has been kind of pushed to the back is more yeah. of this. It, now it's about symptom management. So all the, the, the trying to prove in the system is, is. But remember, it's, it's about that because that's the, that's the industry in which it comes from. And that's all they understand. Right. Of, of course, but they're looking to the now create maintenance drugs, whereas what we're seeing, the overwhelming anecdotal evidence from around the world from a lot of people are going, you know, people with uh, asthma, suddenly not having asthma. Do you know what I mean? I Reverse used to have asthma. I used to have asthma. Yeah. Tyler Green as well. Shout out Tyler when he quit that uh, big old uh, bad tobacco back in the day. Yeah. Same, same thing. You know what I mean? We're seeing di diabetes. Do you know what I mean? We're starting to see the way that the cannabis, the phytocannabinoids that are then consumed on its effects on the endogenous cannabinoid system because it regulates basically everything from respiration to reproduction. Yeah. It's We now start to understand how it's neural transmitters as well with, with the, the cannabinoids are on the signals and the way that we're really starting to get into this, and it's, it's starting to look like 
the although cannabis isn't a panacea, a cure all, it is like the ultimate vitamin or yeah. nut- nutrient. I mean, I think I remember describing it as a, as a base nutrient as a, that is a requisite for good health. Yeah, and I think that that is the almost the argument we need to present well, they've here. they've lost the endocannabinoid system, haven't they? They're, they're, they're stuck in that, or this one treats that s- symptom, and they've not thought, well, hang on, what is the endocannabinoid system? What does it do? How does it work? Why? Why do these cannabinoids attach to this system and then suddenly make everyone... So yeah. let's, you know, they, they haven't yeah. gone this to the next step, to the next level, yeah. and that's what we because, need to do. Because they're making money on level one. Because yeah, the next questions yeah, from that are yeah. the next questions yeah. from that are well. Then wait, why why is runners high? We now know is an endogenous of it's you're producing more endogenous cannabinoids. So we're starting to understand then how cannabinoids have effects on neural hormones, so things like adrenaline, serotonin, etc. Um, so there's things like just regulating with exercise. Mm-hmm. Is gonna you will have a more regulated uh, endocannabinoid system, and your systems will seem to work. If you dysregulate the endocannabinoid system, other systems dysregulate. So what the current system is looking at is going, this system's dysregulating. Give it something so it stops dysregulating, rather than going, why did that dysregulate? <laughs> and that should be the, the the first conversation. And mm-hmm. the countries like Israel are quietly doing that in their private healthcare sector. They're really starting to look at the idea of understanding how to map. What profile of chemovars would then go best with an individual patient? They're really starting to get ahead of the game on that. And we're at the minute still just trying to go, well, does it work for, it worked for 50 out of 75 people, make a drug, sell it to 75,000 of them. And then if it doesn't work for them, well, oh, there was something wrong with with whatever. British way. It it, it is, but it's, I still think, yeah, as you said, if a grow your own of self-identification, the reason I stood at parliament and we'll go through the EPA Bit of parliament in a minute but the reason i came down and stood so powerfully and was happy to champion and scream and get in that that uh forever that kicked off in the the adjacent green when Callie blackwell was arrested was because i i believed in the idea of self-identification that if it could be you've got your doctor and your doctor goes actually you know you do consume cannabis and you did have these ailments or you do have this or you saying this i believe you here's a piece of paper that approves you if that system would is to be put into place i think then there'll be enough exploitation in the same way that we saw in California that the legislation will change organically. So it wouldn't actually take as much lobbying and as much pressure. And it also takes the pressure off of people that can then just go, well, I'll self-identify. They can then self-grow, create these trading uh, positions where people are not selling it to each each other. That then starts to tackle organized crime, which again, I'm not talking about your entrepreneurs and your dealers that are bagging up in your mylars or whatever. I'm talking about the the big boys here. You know what I mean? Without being... um, xenophobic talking about you know the albanians lithuanians russians we've got some big big international organized gangs in the uk popping off supply of boxes hundreds of pounds thousands of pounds in some cases cheaper than local supply and just destroying the industry in the uk since the clubs were kind of really hampered by covid and people really couldn't get out there was a resurgence in home grow but now that a lot of the hydro industry that i'm visiting at the minute and speaking to again the drop-off they can't compete whereas if you could suddenly have that protection people would put, pay that price the tax is there rather than going to a private corporation and a clinic and a pharmacy registered offshore it would then literally go into the coffers of the councils it would go literally into the treasury because they'd be paying tax on their feeds on their newt on their electricity on their water on their seeds do you know what i mean they'd be paying more tax than most of the corporations in this country while I've, being able to self-medicate and get a, that grow that relationship with cannabis as we've spoke of you know well, I, I've always advocated for self-identification. I, and I've always advocated that cannabis is therapeutic and that nobody should be criminalised for it. If, um, I think slightly before your time, we did a group called the National Cannabis Coalition, and we uh, the UPA signed up to this. And this was our this is what we our remit was: legal cannabis for all adults, legal medical cannabis for everyone. Mm. And I still believe in that. I still believe that that is true, and that is where I want to be. And that is where the, where, that's where the niche, the line for me is that mm-hmm. nobody should be criminalized for consuming cannabis. However, we do live in reality and in reality, our best front and our best way is to poke at the stuff that's already happened and is to f- mm-hmm. widen that. Like I've heard you say, we were promised the door. We were promised we'd open the door and then it'd be held open for us. You're expecting disabled people to hold open doors. 
Ooh, ooh, good visual metaphor. Good visual metaphor. So, you know, the doors are open. Yeah. You just need to walk through them. There, there's no, there's no door that needs well, to be. I, 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 would, I, would, I would argue that the, the door was was shut, and that a lot of people were kept outside. Hence, the the fifteen thousand yeah. got inside, and the rest sort of haven't. Um, but I think that the difference is now that together we kick the doors off the fucking hinges. Do you know what I mean? Rather well, the than the doors just, open uh, like a little bit, isn't it? It's yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, it's unlocked. It's, it's, it's unlocked. Yeah, we can see yeah. the light. We can see, we can see the light. The chain is still on the other side, but there's a little trickle that's able to get through. We need to yeah. get round and like, unlock that chain and open the door fully. That's what we need well, yeah, to do. And that's where infiltration comes in, as we've spoke yeah. of. I, uh, as I alluded to in conversation before we started recording, obviously I speak to a lot of academics and people in different organizations and companies uh, around the UK that are these kind of, I don't want to say agent provocateurs, but they are people within yeah. the system that work within that system because yeah. they believe that the time will come for a change where they will be able to, yeah, obviously capitalize on it, but also in their belief, do real good with it. So I think that a, a, a council, a, a, a collective of individuals fighting again for that unified statement, but of the council is the representatives of each industry. So of the people that want the uh, the industrial applications and production commercial applications of uh, low THC cannabis, those that want to create the CBD only industry, um, those that want to have the, the therapeutic and um, sort of wellness, and then those who want to have the prescription pharmaceutical sort of system, and then just everybody else sort of thing. And there's champions of each that then, yeah. so that although they can lobby in different points, when they're, they've got in that door, they go, oh, by the way, we represent this organization as well. And it's all part of the same mm -hmm. collective argument. So it doesn't matter, is each hole, it's part yeah. of the fork. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's not yeah. just one, it's yeah. going to drive the whole thing through. That's, that's what I'd hoped, you know, that's what I'd hoped it would be. And that's what the National Cannabis Coalition was aiming to be, you know. And, you know, you say agent provocateurs and people that destroyed things within. But the reason why that movement didn't go forward was because there wasn't broad support for it and it, it mm. fell apart. Mm. So the UPA, we went, uh, we went at it alone. Mm. It's, we didn't want to. We didn't want to. We did not want to. I, 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 like, I really believe in unity in the community. I really believe that we are stronger together. And I really believe, you know, no ifs and buts and any, whatever, but had we been able, whatever the, whoever, there's no one to blame, but had we all been able to come together as a community and go, you know what, we don't agree on everything, but let's at least have open communication let's have respectful mm. communication you know let's not and i won't say who did this but let's not call other activists cunts in front of parliament when there's media right there you know stuff stuff like that that's just like yeah this what yeah that I, went down that happened like mm -hmm. and like it meant that certain people within the upa that i tried very 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 hard to rein in I was unable to rein them in because I was fighting all these other battles, all these other things going on within the community, trying to trying to like just show my heart to them to yeah. to, to, to be believed that I'm in it for the right reason that I'm not going to run off when they offer me the money. And look, did I run off when they offered me the money? No, I did not. I watering sums of money were offered. Did I take it? No. Did other yeah. people want to take it? Of course they did. And what happened? And who's now in charge of the UPA? And how much money is in the bank account? So it shows you that integrity, mm. money's important, but integrity came first and it was hard. And I wish those problems didn't happen within the community, but they did. Yeah. And certain people liked on both sides, certain people thrived off of those fights and then thus stood their own raised their own position within each faction because of that right that's that's yeah. that's what happened unfortunately but and that's why we need to go no 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 we can't be dealing with that anymore like that's the past and that's how it was but we surely have learned from our mistakes surely there's enough people that are around now that were around then have been through it and can say well you know what simp is still here he still says the right thing. Maybe I, maybe I, you know. I, have, I haven't, I, I, sorry to interject here, but I definitely haven't always, and I think it's quite an appropriate time to, no. I guess, make, yeah, make, make, it, make, a, make apologies to yourself, to Greg, to quite a few others that there were 
mm. individuals with such vested interests that I think is not going to come. To, unfortunately, some of them won't come to light because of circumstances mm. and others won't come to light for a very long time. But there were people that spent a lot of money that put in a lot of effort to trick, frankly, to gaslight individuals like myself into believing certain narratives, into mm. championing certain ideals, mm. into even speaking their language. This is why in my, my latter years in this, I'm really trying to make yeah. amends for things, understand yeah. where we've been so we can understand where we go together so that we don't trip over each other again. So I right. firmly hold my hand up in sincere apology to yeah. anything atrocious that I, and I probably yeah. will have. I was a very, very angry activist at the start of this. And we've all I did... been angry activists, haven't we? And that's what happens yeah. like, when you're in your 20s and this this injustice, this makes you angry. But like when you hit your 30s and you start realizing like that, okay, there's a bigger picture here. You know, how, how am I perceived? What am I doing? How, how does my, in, how do my actions impact everything that's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, it's, it's why you said not everyone can be humble enough to admit that, that they were wrong. They can't to, to, to say that, to come together as two different opposing sides and say, you know what, we got it wrong in this, this and that. And then from my side, we got it wrong on loads of stuff. We were trying our best, but, you know, I say it's, it's, we were run on the promise of a shoestring. So, you know, it was really tough. And then on your side, maybe certain language and certain viewpoints were radicalized in that side of the community to further that divide so even even more so that there were active campaigns of direct misinformation yes there were presentations produced of certain individuals yeah. uh, attributed to be in, uh fucking shills for till rate and all kinds of things mm -hmm. there was a hell of a lot of misinformation but it was quite masterfully uh, tied together with truth enough truth yeah. that then then when the champions started to speak and yeah the point like i said i was I was angry because I was watching what we were feeling was being presented to us, which was this self-identification, grow your own, et cetera. And then this, what, okay, then why are pharmaceutical companies involved? We're, we're, yeah, I know they're going to make drugs. That's part of the conversation. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and obviously then yeah. fracture happened amongst um, UKCSC and other organizations. But so the UPA was at its peak, I suppose, then the Tea Party. The Tea Party. It, yeah. it was uh, the Labour MP... Paul Flynn. Paul Flynn, and it was the what became known as the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bryce, Bryce Bill, yeah. which I still think was one of the best worded bills. Well, it, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't medical, it was medicinal, and it basically allowed for everything we spoke of. Grow your own self-identification, and it moved all cannabis from that schedule. So it also meant that there was a less punitive measure for people that couldn't prove um, legit air quotes, air quotes, massive air quotes, legitimate uh, usage. Do you know what I mean? So it would create enough discretion that it would basically nullify the law and it was best of both worlds. But then very quickly, things started to, to sort of feel wrong. So in your sort of words, I guess, what, what sort of happened? Because as I say, I think that was, in my estimation as an outsider, I feel the peak of UPA, like everyone championed it. You had people from all the different generations traveled from hundreds of fucking miles and everyone was happy to to champ oh shit, to champion uh, medical first, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I think from my point of view, that was a high point. But I think the vi the divisions were were clear and very apparent way before that. The d the divisions and the divided lines at that movement at that at that event were very very apparent from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those lines were already drawn. Um, what happened in government? Well, the bill was eventually was rejected, wasn't it? Mm. And then it's still sat on second reading if you look on uh, a Parliament website. Yeah, this you know, uh, yeah. So that it was just stalled, you know. And then what happened was the Tories realised, well, we're looking really bad. Uh, Billy Colwell might die if we don't give him back his medicine. And if this kid dies, we are going to be like, we probably could lose an election because of, of uh, something like that. So we're going to have to change it. So they changed it, but they did it like the most minimal that they could possibly do to save face. Mm -hmm. um, and we weren't invited to those meetings when it came to writing those that policy essentially yeah. like all of our work before that was about self-identification was about in include making sure that grow your own was included like it wasn't our uh, our flagship 
so to speak, rescheduling cannabis was our flagship. But remember, it was rescheduling cannabis, not rescheduling medical cannabis. Yeah. That the definition of the UPA's aims was to reschedule cannabis to allow to to accept that cannabis has medicinal value. That's the, that was the words, and that got shaped and changed by the, the powers that be to go. Well, how can we do it so we can control it? And and that and that's what's happened, but. That wasn't necessarily any fault of any activism or campaigning that happened. Uh, it's necess- that's the fault of the powers that be and the fact that we have a Tory government and the fact that any policy that they bring in is going to be focused on how to make the rich richer and not how to how to make a better, more equal society. And that's, that's why me and you are both in this for that, right? Yeah. That's our aims. That's what we want to see, a, mo- a better, more equal society. Mm-hmm. How is it be? They don't want that. They they thrive on that divide, and they have, you know, th- th- they're they're different people. They've they've come over from Normandy, and then they've been in power, and they've had this completely different upbringing and raising to the vast majority of the people that live in this country. So, when they say they're different, they are different. They think differently. Their generation, they've had generations worth of thinking differently, and. You know, rightly or wrongly, it's generations worth of pressure on their shoulders to do their dad and their dad's dad and their dad, you know, yeah. the working classes haven't necessarily had that. So we've had a little bit more freedom to be ourselves. Yeah. They're very structured, their society is very rigid. You've seen you've seen what can happen if someone steps out of that, they're like shunned and then whatever. So it's like we're we're fighting really against like centuries worth of indoctrination of the ruling elite and how they structure the power in this country and how they retain control of this country. And of course the people in government who are all Etonians, who are all wealthy people who who you know multiple millionaires and billionaires, of course their main mindset is right okay well we've got to do something but how do we still control it you know and so we won we made them do something we proved that we that, that patients are powerful mums of sick kids they proved it they took that you know it's only a mother could have done it really only a mother could have the tenacity that that Hannah Deacon and um, Charlotte Colwell had but at the same time doing concurrent things to push that change. And, you know, one probably wouldn't have happened without the other kind of thing. Like it's what those two mums did like is incredible. And we should really learn from that lesson, learn from that message and, and learn that we're powerful. Like I won't make no pleas. I'm making demands. We're powerful. We've never been more powerful. I've got my legal prescription. I can go anywhere I want and I can take my prescription cannabis and you are not going to stop me. And do you think I'm going to just sit at home now and like stay in and not do that? Or do you think I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a point of going, where's your medicinal cannabis vaping area, please? Because I need to vape my medicinal cannabis today everywhere I go, you know, and and it's, it's small incremental changes like that that are happening and that's 15,000 people that now have access to a life and have a legal protection that can go and fight for everyone else and be like, well, where's your medical cannabis space? Blah, 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 blah. Where's my vaping area? Blah, blah. You know, you can, these doors, these conversations where you would have been told to piss off, basically what medical, no, what cannabis vaping? You can't vape cannabis. That's a no. And now you've got this script, you're legally protected they've got to provide you a space to, to vape because that's your medicine. Like it, it changes yeah. that. And yeah, it's in its infancy and yeah, it's very new and not every patient wants to go and do that. But I, I guarantee you thousands of patients right now are thinking about where they want to go with their family and how they're going to contact that, that organization or that place or that where, wherever and tell them about their medicine and be protected legally from that. And that's going to have change that's going to change lots of people's minds and they have to they have to it's like even oh well my my brother my brother's mates he took tone with skunk and then he went crazy so you know it's, it's really you know no I don't care like yeah. you are yeah. now legally a obliged to provide me as a patient with an area to consume my medicine thank you please where is that yeah exactly it does create a space for 
a next form of activism within the the nuanced um, sort of arm of uh, prescription cannabis. Yeah, and I agree, and that is a good forefront to to push on. Uh, I do want to do a big shout out to uh, Steve Moore and to the media machine because without it, none of this would have happened, right. frankly. <laughs> um, you would never thought them fucking words would have come out of my fucking mouth. I, I, but, I'm, I'm but, a little but, to hear it myself. No, but, not, yeah. not, I, I'm not going to defame the man right now or say yeah. anything because now I've actually spoken of him, but I, have, I speak of the mor- moralist. Not the monolith, the moralith, mm. because that was what it was in opposition to a lot of our great movement. Mm. They were the progenitors of astroturfing of the industry, as far as I am concerned. For all then, people have moved on to greener pastures with CMC, ACI, and are now going global to take over the goddamn world. Um, yeah, it's, it, my point is, it was quite a, more of a joke than anything else, because I'm not going to fuck Steve more, but kind of fuck <laughs> more. Um, the media, the point is media. Yeah, they understood that putting women at the forefront with their children, and it's not just Hannah and Charlotte, You've got Tanine, you've got Karen, you've got oh, yeah. a multitude of many other wonderful, All of powerful, All of powerful, powerful women. And again, it's that you speak of the tenacity. I think there's there's a structural change that happens within the brain when a mother gives birth. And I think part of that, they recognize actually that, that you're threatening their child. And I think that that is so emotive that we can recognize that as humans for all, even the, the people like myself that choose to would never have children can still understand part of the biology and the anthropological connection to, 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 to kinship, to, you know, to, to having children. Um, so I kind of, I, I can get that, but it, there's also other arguments and elements, you know, it is the store individual stories that each of us have to tell, you know what I mean? Of a lifetime of struggle, of oppression, of stigmatization for our, for our individual choices. You know, there are, millions hundreds of millions of people out there that maybe are medicinal consumers but they don't recognize it they don't know it they don't know the language or like me they're almost in my spirit is in rebellion against it because as i've said i'm happy to give my information to the right people to inform but i don't want you to tell me what i can and can't do because i'm going to do it anyway this is my argument where i'm helping with the cic uh Yes, it's so many acronyms, CIC, the Cannabis Industry Council, mm-hmm. um, is to try to get them to understand this idea that anything you don't put in your argument, there's going to happen anyway. If you don't, you don't regulate for edibles, guess what? Edibles are going to happen. You don't regulate for extracts, guess what? Extracts are going to happen. happen. Yeah. You, you, it's stupid. These things are already here. Draw lines around what is, make go f- first through harm reduction, then to benefit maximization, then to capitalization and commercialization. Once the people you truly understand what's going on, rather than going the new psychosis we're seeing in America is about extracts. Mm-hmm. And they're going, oh, well, all these extracts are doing all this and that and that and this. And yes, any consumer of any product can develop a problematic relationship. According to the World Health Organization's own studies, it's about 9% for cannabis of people that can develop dependency issues. That is higher, or in a good proportion of that, is amongst tobacco, coke, morbid tobacco consumers. People also use um, tobacco at the same time. Comorbid is not the right word I was going for there, but you know what I mean? Um, I think polydrug users, I think it was way off the spectrum. But my point is that when controlled, those statistics get very minute. And actually even within them, when you look at hereditary, um, as in terms of um, propensity towards schizoid type disorders or psychotic type disorders because of it being uh, in the family, uh, environmental factors, et cetera, that number gets even smaller. So actually, yes, there will always be an argument to prevent the harm, but we're not having a massive campaign about like Krispy Kreme. I pronounce that terribly. You can tell I don't eat their donuts. But as a company, like the damage, yeah. if you then look sugar, at the economic sugar is, part, perfect, sugar is a perfect example to, to show against it and to say, well, hang on, here's this substance that can, if misused, misuse cause some harm so how can we how should we regulate it and how should we you know and and, and cannabis could could in could for a small number of people trigger a psychotic episode of people who might who would have gone on to develop one anyway that's pretty much that's pretty much where where we're at with but the, it's i think the language I was, we can't say trigger because in the dsm5 yeah, the, yeah. The, there is not a drug-induced psychosis. Okay. So the language that psychiatry currently uses, I believe, is that preci- precipitates a psychosis type event. Yeah. Because then the psychosis type event and the precipitates, it came before. So they can't state correlation or causal. Do you know what I mean? Because again, it's so nuanced and it's so screwed up of how backward you talk about the UK. The Lancet of psychiatry, or in the Lancet, there's a psychiatry section. 
that's where the first Royal Commission was published in 1997, which is what led to GW being founded and ultimately cannabis being reduced to a class B for a small period of time. And the creation of that, that wonderful wave of activism of Chris Baldwin and, and Colin Davies and, and many others. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then in that, you then had 10, 15 years of skunk psychosis and it causes all these problems. And now we're starting to see in psychiatry starting to lead the forefront again of all these doctors going, I prescribe it for everything and it helps everything. What is going on? I've said to patients for years, stop it. It's ruining your life. And they can't notice this and they don't understand. I need to take a little break because I just need to go to the toilet. Yeah, no worries. I'm going to quickly, I'm just going to keep talking if that's all right, actually. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, so hope you're enjoying this one, folks. Uh, we're going to go on for a little bit longer. I've got a few more questions to ask Clark. Um, yeah, if you alluded to here, the, the UPA is coming back, baby, um, which for the patients, I think, is a wonderful thing. It is, is great for you a lot because for all I try and champion, I don't necessarily understand the, the nuance of your, of your argument and of your fight. And Clark, as you've now been educated on, has been around here for a good 10 years of this. He's, he's been at the forefront of patient uh, reform. So I think uh, as a champion and an advocate, I think possibly, uh, yeah, someone for, for y'all to back. And I think, uh, as we've alluded, I don't know if necessarily we're going to rise to the top of the gene pool as, uh, as the two leaders of this, but I definitely think that uh, uh, a cooperation between the leadership, between whoever and whomever rises collectively to lead and champion this next wave of activism in the UK, it needs to be in tandem with all sides. So it's not even just the medicinal or prescription system um, and sector. It also then needs to be hemp uh, for all. I hate the fucking term, <laughs> low THC cannabis or industrial agricultural, whatever nomenclature we're going to come up with to define that. Um, but colloquially currently termed as hemp. I mean, yeah, equal hemp. Um, your CBD industry, as we were speaking of before, sort of your wellness, sports and nutrition as well is another huge potential industry that's not really regulated uh, in the same sort of way. It's getting caught up in novel foods, uh, et cetera. You've then got vapables. You've obviously then got the... Oh, here we go. He's back. back. Welcome back, brother. I'm just stating to the fine folk at home um, that, yeah, there the needs to be whoever rises to the sort of the top of this I don't even like the idea of a hierarchical system, but in terms of leadership, um, that that cooperation um, and yeah, that mutual respect between all sectors. And I, I think in my head, it is it's this council. It's like Lord of the Rings esque. Yeah, you know, somebody rises and we all put a, a weapon in and go. All right, we're going to go march to Parliament. We're going to kick the doors in and, and and get what we we deserve here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's do it. Let's let's unite the warring tribes, as they say. That's because it. we've got we've got a greater enemy, and that is prohibition. Prohibition has declared war on all of us. Whether I'm now I'm now protected a little bit or whatever, it's still mm. it's fuck my life up. Yeah. It's still still a form. It's like Prohibition 2.0. It's okay, the ne- okay. next iteration. They've they're, taken a few no, steps off. Really, like, They've lightened they, it. They fucked my life up, mate. Like, mm. if my stepdad had been able to get medical cannabis when he needed it, straight away, would he have died when I was 11? I don't think he would have. Mm. Prohibition has fucked my life up. So mm. I might have this legally now, but believe me, this is just an armor. This is just an armor that I can now use to fight harder. Mm-hmm. Because this war is on us all. I may now be off the battlefield. I'm now maybe in a safer place, but I can plan, I can strategize, I can fight. I'm not leaving this fight. I'm not going home. I'm not going anywhere else. This is my life. This is my entire life. My life has led me to this point. My stepdad experience my own experience with, with it true too. And then traveling and meeting and I've got to set, I've got a name drop. Den- Dennis Perone, mm. Dennis Perone, Legend. spending time at Dennis Perone's B and B like living there for a little bit with Dale when we were filming grassroots. Like I would go to San Francisco and I'd go meet him and talk with him and ask him questions. And I got, you know, access to, to the man himself, the, the pioneer, and he taught me, I'm not going to drop that. Yeah. I'm not going to lose that. I'm not going to pretend like I'm. Not, that's not where I'm from. Just because I've now got this protection and I've got this armor to help me to protect myself and protect my family, yeah, 
it means like I can go to Legoland with my son. I can take my cannabis and I can medicate, you know, I can live that life. I'm not going to leave everyone else behind. The no patient left behind thing comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that wasn't about saying we're going to get everything done now. And that was, that came out of my brain. That, that was something that I really firmly believed and tried to get everyone else at the UPA essentially to sign up to and to agree to. And that was that I'm not going to stop until everyone has legal access to this plant in whichever way they deem fit. I'm not yeah. going to stop until that. We're not going to stop until that. It might be slow. We might have to do the little things and little steps along the way, stepping stones along the way, but we're not going to give up. And yeah, you know, I've seen, I've seen uh, some hate coming my way for, for that, you know, about how, you know, we said no patient left behind and then I just disappeared. And rightly so, I can understand why people would feel that way. I, did, I didn't just disappear though. I had to look right. out for my family and now I'm back. Mm -hmm. and the message is clear. The message is firm. The message is not going to budge. Everyone deserves legal access to this plant in whichever way they deem fit. Everyone across the board, mm -hmm. across That's, the board. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have said that many a time, but I think it's really important to say it again, clarify that again, and say that's what I mean by no patient left behind. Mm -hmm. No, no one left behind. I don't want to see anyone criminalised for this miracle plant. That's, that's made my life so much more bearable. You know, I, I owe everything to this plant. Mm -hmm. Everything. You know, I moved to Brighton to campaign. That's why I'm here. I was like, right, I need to campaign. Who do I need as my MP? I mean, Caroline Lucas. Right, let's move to Brighton. So I did. Met my, met my partner here. And now I have a son. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's all very strange. But my, my, I guess my reward... Uh, mm -hmm. my reward for my decade of campaigning is that I now have a family mm -hmm. I have a son and I now even though it's horrible have a legal protection and can medicate at Legoland so you know I'm really really grateful and happy for that movement like to not have to worry to not have to fear for my, for my family like that's victory, I man. I couldn't have done it. I could, I could not. I would have had to give up. I would have had to give up if this. Mm. If I didn't have this, uh, this method to get this legally, I would have had to completely withdraw from campaigning life and st stop when I had a family because mm. I wouldn't have been able to put them through it. I just wouldn't. Yeah. And I know many people campaigners that have had to do that, and you know what? They don't necessarily have to do that anymore because there is a route to not having to do that and to carry on. So yeah, like I, I hear you. It's not been perfect. It's not been far from perfect. In fact, it's like awful what's actually happened, the way that it's happened, the the quality of the of the medicine yeah. prescription, the quality of the prescription is mm -hmm. you know, it leaves a lot to be desired. But what doesn't leave a lot to you know what, what has changed is like that that ability to be with my family that ability to, mm. to just be a father to be ever present yeah so there's a almost a, a wonderful kind of <clears throat> poetic justice in that the time you didn't get with your stepfather is the time that you get with your son it is the exactly that you, i think we in this life i spoke about jeff smith on recently mp and uh, I said that we champion best from the positions of experience. And I think that you embody that in that literally you had that experience in with the stepfather with MS, you watched him with cannabis, you then got a diagnosis of MS immediately went, well, fuck, cannabis works. I, I, I know this, I've seen this yeah. shit. And then you had all Ooh, these, I know what I'm <laughs> yeah, and had all these doors closed and every time still had that fortitude to, to kick them open while still sort of battling a condition, I think is, is, is commendable, is entirely respectable. And I think as I stated in your brief absence there, that I think that you are the, the, the person to champion in this. I'm not, I've long since stepped away from being anti anybody. I don't have the patience, I don't have the time, I don't have it in my spirit or soul anymore. I want to build. And the way you change things is you build better systems that replace outdated systems. I'm no longer trying to scale and destroy the moralists. 
I'm not interested in, in dealing with these massive adversarial things. I believe that championing and campaigning for these certain ideals and concepts, which you have, I think, articulated wonderfully over the past two hours, are, are the way forward. So I think that I'm nothing more than grateful for you for being, again, so vulnerable and honest and open to to recount your experiences and your your uh, your your story here because i think it is it is a powerful one that people need to to also to hear but also need to be reminded that they are powerful as you've stated that yeah. in, individually so we, powerful. we have great strengths but collectively when we can get out of our own ego's way when we can get out of our mm -hmm. own simple pettiness and again i hope that some of what we've covered um is is helped to heal the historic wounds within the community in some way that again it wasn't the UP, or it definitely wasn't your intention that, that drove the direction of this i mean i would like to potentially maybe touch on without naming any names kind of what happened with an incident with with data which i think is yeah, the, that's the, a big that's a big one i think needs to be addressed needs to be kind of spoken about because i think without if we don't touch on that the trust just won't be there. So yeah. we, we need to go there. I need to be honest. I need to tell the truth about what happened. Yeah. So would you mind sort of explaining yeah. the situation? Yeah. I can explain the situation. So as I said, eye watering sums of money were offered to the EPA, mm -hmm. um, essentially to, I'm not going to say the amount, but it's, oh my God, I could be, I could have just taken that and run and, oh my goodness, I could have had like, I could have an island in the, not quite an island in the Caribbean, but you know, I, I could, I could have done that and I, I just couldn't. Other people within the EPA, that wasn't necessarily what they wanted. And unfortunately, um, within various board meetings, agendas became very clear from some people um, to the point where I basically had to put my foot down and had to say no. I have the final say. I don't care what you think. Sorry. Like, oh, I do care what you think, but you're wrong. And actually... I've just caught you out on a few things there. So should I trust you moving forward? And that just, the, the board then imploded. Um, and yeah, basically uh, we went our separate ways and the person was the data controller for the EPA and had access to the data and decided it would be a good idea to create a new organization I would guess to try capture the incoming money that was being thrown, various different sources all saying, hey, basically, hey, we'll give you money. No, we'll give you money, but we want an exclusive, but we'll give you this much money, but we'll only do it if you were exclusive. So basically, uh, you want us to be bought out and you want us to be your new lobby group in Parliament. Okay, no thanks. Um, I was not down for that. That's not what I signed up for. I don't know amount of money is, is could budge me on that, but that wasn't, yeah, as I say, that wasn't necessarily what everyone else thought. So I think the new organizations were set up to try and capture some of that funding, which it didn't really, it didn't really do. So, um, but during that, the, the data controller took the data and then emailed the UPA list or the email list uh, of their new product or their new project saying basically saying hey this is a this is a new kind of medical cannabis project blah 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 blah, blah which obviously is in breach of gdpr mm -hmm. and is it has been an absolute nightmare um we immediately fired him we immediately called the relevant authorities we immediately said the truth of what happened and apologized mm -hmm. and that is all we can really do. It's I, I'm really sorry that I that I trusted somebody that was untrustworthy. That was really this yes, he did that, but I'm the one that allowed him to be the data monitor. I'm the one ultimately that has the ultimate responsibility of that data. And I failed the community in that respect. And I, I'm really sorry that that happened. 
if I could rewind time and fire him a long time before, I would. But, you know, that's the benefit of hindsight, I guess. Um, yeah, we come, coming back it is slow progress. And a lot of that reason is because there's been a lot of things to unravel that, that, that uh, previous directors did and um the list is actually really long and completely nightmarish and is another reason why it's taken me like two years to be ready to come back because i've got to get everything in order um we're not there yet but um i can you heard it here first united patients alliance will be physically coming back we'll have a physical presence at this year's product earth Itching. so it's in the process of happening we're in the process of dotting the i's crossing yeah dotting the, dotting the i's crossing the t's and making sure everything's done have a new data controller who has previous experience with it is also a trusted member of the community i think will go down well um that you know i'm taking it a lot more seriously than i did mm -hmm. i think i think my biggest my biggest 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 problem or issue or thing that i did wrong is naivety so, i was so <laughs> naive. i was so naive i was like yeah we'll just it will go fine we'll just change the world man you know and i'm like oh it, it, uh, it's not quite that simple it's not quite that easy and you know it was prohibition it was you know dark days of prohibition really dark dark days it's still prohibition i know but for, for me i'm i'm feeling the light of slightly out of the tunnel and i'm gonna come over you know that's what i'm trying to do but it was dark days for everyone and it's, it was hard for everyone and that that fear and that like just worry it means that you you lean on others that you might not necessarily lean on had you been in a better place. And I think that that is my biggest problem. My biggest thing is that I, I'm just, I'm just too naive and I'm too idyllic and I'm, I, I get lost in the dream and I forget about, okay, for that to happen. Yeah. It needs to be this, 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 and this, otherwise that's not going to happen. Yep. You know? and, and that, and that is my biggest flaw. And that's the, that's the thing that where I, where I need, a counterbalance to go well no you know what about this what about that and and i think it you know the, the new people that i'm going to be working with in the upa it's going to be different it's going to be run differently it was i think everybody knows that the upa is a company so we tried to become a charity but obviously prohibition uh -uh, you cannabis chat we tried to get a bank account. We just even tried to get a bank account and they were like, no, 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 no. So we ended up having to be like, okay, we need to be some form of legal entity. Uh, uh, the only route to us that we can actually do is to open up a company and for all the, and for the company to all dividends to be reinvested into camp campaigns. And that's essentially what the EPA was basically. Yeah. Um, so it was run by volunteers a lot. And I think that's that's my main aim moving moving forward is to try and generate some income streams for the UPA so that we can have some paid employment because I just don't think it's fair to I just don't think it's fair that a lot of this work has fallen on the back of people that are already quite sick. And then those people also haven't been paid for their time and for their effort and for their energy. And I don't think everyone should be rich off the back of it but i think you know minimum wage at least is you know what people should be aiming for in this and in, in, in their work and what they're doing so yeah. my aim is to go slowly is to is to generate some income streams generate some some money in the bank account so that i can pay some staff so that the, the burden of the hard work can actually be done by people that are paid to do it and the patients can actually get on with the real work of what they want to do, like actually going out, talking to people, going to events, like having a life. That, that's what patients can focus on, like, mm -hmm. and then and, and that's a job for other people. So I'm, I'm working on it at the moment. Um, I'm really blessed to live in Brighton, um, and Brighton Council 
So I ended up, I ended up in uh, 2018, I also ended up in hospital, um, like severe relapse, um, came out, they, they, they wouldn't let me go home without support. Basically the, the neuro rehab team were like, no, you, you can't, you can't carry on just living like this. Cause frankly, I didn't have a good life cause I can't do much. Right. And, and all the energy that I ever had was all focused solely on the campaign. It's like, do the campaign, do the campaign. So they're like, you can't, you literally you can't live like that anymore. So they gave me a few hours to help me with my life and, Included in that is some time to help me with my campaigning activities and my campaigning work. So, yes, Brian Council have given me two hours a week to how to employ somebody to help me run the UPA. That's again, if it, yeah. very much a change, very uh, considering where we where we've been. Yes. Th so, yeah. So I'm now I have now have that help and now have that support which I didn't have before, and you know that makes. It, it a lot easier for me to do the right things to make sure patients are represented and no one's being left out. You know, I don't, I say no one's being left out inevitably like people, it's going to just be widened and widened and widened and widened. You know, that's how it's going to work. That's how things have changed everywhere else. And that's how that's human nature, mm. especially Tory government nature change. Oh, we'll just keep it the same, but we change just a little bit. You know, yeah, that, well, that's, that's the dominant mindset. Yeah, well, back to the empire. We just, oh, the good old days of empire. You know, oh, it's like, uh, yeah. oh, that, but that's where we are. That's where we live. So we've got, we've got to be mindful of that in what we're doing. We've got to be mindful of that in how we come across and in the campaigns that we run and in the language that we use. And I think you're really right to, to shine a light on, on, the, on the use of language. And I think that's, that's something that I've, tried to talk about a lot as well maybe in some places actually i might not have put it perfectly but lang the language that we're using and, and the, the, the words that we're using have power and and we need to be mindful to get those right as a community we need to have a sit round and we need to go okay what, so what is the message what's this unified message that we're all going to agree to they were all going to say in whatever we're doing, whatever our separate niches is, maybe it's WTU's legal campaigns, maybe it's Carly's card, maybe it's UPA's relaunch, maybe it's you, you doing whatever you're up to, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter who's doing it. Hey, this is the message. This is the words that we're saying. And we nearly got there with the National Cannabis Coalition, but it was led by the wrong person. And that led to the community to be able to destroy it. Yeah. So we need a new national cannabis coalition. We need a, a, tr a truly democratic one. I think the we difference do. between now and then is there's so much more experience. The rest of the world has turned itself on and this industry is coming alive. And we have a lot of places we can learn lessons from and we, we can take good elements from. And yeah, I think exactly that. The standardization of nomenclature and of terminology gives us an understanding that we can challenge this and we can challenge academics and show that we they maybe don't know what they think they know. And that's not to up, uh, upset anybody or to, you know, embarrass anybody, yeah. but it's just to show that again, we have power, our decades of that's lived science. experience. Yeah. We are decades of lived experience, our anecdotes, everything else. Yeah, it matters. And again, what you're saying with the, the words are power. That is how we take our power back. If we can nullify every argument they have through truth and not through just putting our own personal slant on it or going, well, I heard this or I heard that. If there is ubiquitous access to education information that is true for the patient, that is true yeah. for the consumer, that is true for the grower, that is true for the dealer, mm -hmm. that ubiquity of, it, of standardization of, of education information, I think, yeah, is paramount to the formation of, of any new campaigns moving forward. Um, yeah, well, the, way I, the way I see it, I think I think you've been in the audience when I've said this analogy before. But the way the way I see this actually at the moment is we've got this big horrible monster called prohibition that's like ruining all our lives. Like it's like coming round, it's destroying people, it's taking their children, it's like killing people, it's maiming, it's destroying the environment. It's it's bad on every single level. Yeah. What we've tried to do right, is we've tried to get the sharpest argument against it, which I believe 
is its therapeutic potential. Cannabis's therapeutic potential is the sharpest argument to kill the monster of prohibition. So what we really need to do, and this is what will happen if we get this aligned message together, right? The, the, the therapeutic argument is the spear point. The everyone having the argument in the same thing, that's the poll. We, we, at the moment, the therapeutic argument has been doing the job of like poking holes in this monster. Like the monster's finally like receding a little bit. It's wounded that, you know, there's some, there's, we're actually for the first time in years actually seeing it like change and like be fearful of us. Like we're realizing that we've got power. So if we, can unify the movements all aligned together and we can drive that spear point home, mm -hmm. we're going to kill it. But mm -hmm. if we can't, and that message is all watery and all whatever, medical cannabis activists, and I say that on purpose, they're going to keep going and going, pop, 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 and, but they're not going to get much traction. They're not going to kill mm -hmm. probably. Then they're all, just all, no, all they're going to do is the, the beast is going to figure out how to contain them how to, exactly. to blunt their spear, and that's what exactly. they're already doing through prescription systems, exactly. et cetera. So, so it's, 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 an interesting, it it's an interesting analogy because it brings me to uh, Cedar Futures' uh, mm -hmm. emblem, which is truth is our sword, unity our shield. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's the same. I work as an advisor for, uh, for Cedar Future, and I have always pushed again that that narrative that it is it's unity gives us the power so we have the same mass as the monster or the beast that we're facing and it is the 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 truth is the is the weapon and so exactly like if you approach the way it's not just therapeutic when the guys in lab coats in canada grow it doesn't matter that it's a strain that came from a cult of sorry that came from the um uh, adult consumption market it, it doesn't matter it's they've grown it this way and we've put this little label on it and so now it's safe but if you bought that from Dave down the road, no, it's dangerous. That'll cause psychosis and it's addictive yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's dangerous. Well, skunk, it couldn't be skunk. Poss couldn't possibly be medicine, could it? That's, that makes people go crazy. But oh, hang on, have you seen Nordex releasing real killer skunk this year to the medical cannabis market? If we even have you seen that, have you seen like no. really, honestly, really, how how like how culturally inept do you have to be? Yeah, you write that one down, exactly. Real killer skunk is coming, look, go on medbud.wiki, it shows you the strains that are coming to the market soon, and that's one of them. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't, you know, three weeks ago, we've got cannabis kills, and then in, in a few months' time, we've got real killer skunk coming to, to, to a patient near you. Like, what? It's, it, it also shows how far we are from remembering our own heritage and our truth. Yeah. Yeah. GW's biggest crop, its first main number product, one. the cultivar, is skunk number one. Skunk came into modern nomenclature when hit pieces started appearing in the Sunday papers and in all the rag tops and all the rest of it, talking about skunk psychosis. That is, as you said, this generation's reefer madness. And it yeah. works so well to create this. I think one of the points I brought up in Carly's podcast, mm -hmm. um, which uh, there's quite a few actually I wish I'd have brought up, but hindsight is, is always, you know, whatever the expression is. Um, but it's this ladder that we need to give them a way to climb down from the pedestal. They've built this huge platform in the sky going, it's all this horrible thing. It kills everybody. It yeah. does this one spliff of ruin. And they're shouting all of this rhetoric. And now they've got thousands of people around the base. So it going, you're, hey, you're wrong. Look at this academic paper. You're, no one's ever died. What are you on about? Who dies? No one's ever this. And they're just taking apart these arguments. And so they're really struggling to, to know what to do. They're not going to fucking jump, but before long, we're either going to cut the, the tower and they're going to fall and die and be buried to history and consigned to the annals of, of collective absurdity. Or we give them a ladder and go, get off your fucking pedestal and piss off. Yeah. And I think that's what they need to understand that we will parlay, we will give a safe yeah. space. To, I, I've pitched the idea of a, tr a truth and reconciliation committee, the same yeah. as they had after apartheid in South Africa. Yeah. All sides come together and go, what did you say? What did you say? Well, what the fuck? Yeah. What's the evidence? What's the truth? Let's really get to this and yeah. move forward together. We still have to live with the political class. We still have to live with the prohibitionist uh, pearl clutching grannies reading the Daily Mail. No offense to anybody's granny out there. Mine wasn't quite that. She read the Daily Mail, but actually was really progressive, oddly. Um, but not to make mine doesn't mine doesn't read the Daily Mail, but is less progressive than I'd like. <laughs> you, you get the sentiment. So yeah. it's that okay. it's this this yeah. There's there's so much more that can be done here that I just 
I think we're, we're almost at the start of the, the next level. And if we can have it where we go, okay, we have to live with the police after this. We have to live with these authorities because in a lot of ways they make sense in some institutions. There's a lot of things I'll argue about the police, but this isn't the time for it. But if they're going to exist under a, a, re, a restructuring, as I spoke of with Neil Woods, back to the Pelian principles without the war on drugs, they're no longer the oppressor in our neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. They're only ever called when needed. They're not seen as That's a deterrent. It. There's none of this bullshit. It. It's back to what policing was. We yeah. community deal with ourselves instead of going, I smell weed called police. <laughs> you go, oh, I wonder if it's good kush. I'm going to go trade them. Do you know well, what I mean? That feeling and that point actually is a really, really strong one. And I think that is, that's the reason why I've got my prescription these days. And that's the reason why, you know, I would actually say it's it's not great, but I wouldn't I would say in terms of the fear that you don't have anymore, if you've got that legal script, whether you only consume that or otherwise is up to you. I would make no judgment on anyone doing either way, but having that script having that pot, being able to go to Legoland with your family and go, where's my, it's, it's priceless. It's literally priceless. And the main thing, think about this. And this is as a father, I'm now thinking differently. You know, I'm thinking like generation, generations of things. Like Mm. we've just saved a generation. Like there's my son and Every 15,000 other people who might have children, they're not going to be in fear of having their kids taken off them. They're going to be able to go, hey, this is my, 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 I show him. I'm, I'm like, hey, here it is. This is my vaporizer. And he goes, daddy's medicine, daddy's medicine, daddy's medicine. He knows, like, I'm teaching him and I can because I'm a legal patient. I've got no fear of that whatsoever. I have no fear of him going to school, going like daddy's cannabis. Like, literally, yeah, go, please do. You know, it's it's like that complete shift yeah. in oppressed to having the law on your side. Every person that consumes cannabis deserves that. And that's what I'm fighting for now because I haven't experienced it. I know the benefit of that. All this skunk stuff, all this whatever, I think it's bullshit. I think it's all societal pressure on like, and since cannabis suddenly makes you realize, hang on, I don't have to fit in this box that everyone thinks I should yeah. fit in, especially yeah. in this country with the upper classes and the boxes they force their children into, it breaks that paradigm and it goes, boom, and you're like, fuck, what's that? And, yeah. you know, that, that, that's powerful, actually, if it's utilised in the right way, if it's not seen as this skunk psychosis, if it's seen as skunk enlightenment, if it's seen as, okay, paradigm shift to go, whoa, this world I live in, this world, the way that it's structured, the way that the people in the past still control the present, mm-hmm. that's wrong. And that's what you, know, you suddenly realise all of that when you take cannabis. Like, yeah, well, you think that, that's what that's what that is about. And that's what mm-hmm. really is un- misunderstood and used against us. It, it's again, it's the we then get to the crux of it. The prohibition is then a tool of classism. So there's yeah. a bit, there's a Bill Hicks joke, yeah. which I'm which I'm sure Ollie will appreciate in the background here, uh, where he says that you know, I'd say cannabis makes you lazy. He obviously says marijuana, but I'm not going to state the term. Uh, the cannabis makes you lazy. He's like, no, when you smoke cannabis, you realise that all the shit you normally do isn't worth doing. Yeah. And the word lazy isn't our term. That was handed down to us from the industrialists, from the the, the, the owners and operators of our of our communities, mm-hmm. because then we don't suddenly want to go to work for ninety hours a week to make a billionaire, a, a trillionaire. We yeah, suddenly exactly. don't want to invest in systems of, of cultural oppression against our fellow man. We mm-hmm. suddenly don't want to, you know, live in these these abhorrent little bubbles, as you said. That boom is is true for people that first consume cannabis. It can be quite a whoa. And I personally think a lot of people's uh, versions of, you know, it isn't for me or they, I had a psychosis event yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. is actually them waking up to their own consciousness for the first yeah. time. Their little, their little Jiminy Cricket suddenly made yeah. massive uh-huh. conscience and everything else. And they're like, all these voices. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's your soul, yeah. your spirit, your conscience, yeah. your ego, your id, your super ego, all, all of these all other little whoa, whoa, whoa. Buried. All those things your family and culture has taught you to bury over years. And, you know, you got to think about this. I studied ancient history and archaeology, so I'm like quite a bigger picture kind of person. Like we're all living under generational trauma of of the past of what's happened. Like 
we're still survivors. We're still getting through that. We don't live in the perfect society, the ideal society that we know could exist if we chose it, because it is a choice. Mm-hmm. And that, and that's what that's what the skunk paradigm and that's what skunk or high THC cannabis can do to people. And that's why it's called a psychotic episode by the powers that be, because of course it's psychosis to the powers that be, because it's making them irrelevant now, isn't it? So it's the challenging of paradigm that brings you back then to the prescription thing. And this is not to be offensive to yourself or to any of the other 15,000 individuals. And I, I don't mean it to, I'm just preempting, I guess, the, the uh, wonderful quantum thought that I'm about to try and put into a sentence in the, it's kind of like profit, uh, what's the word, uh, racketeering, in the a small group of people are being told by another group of people, hey, you give us money, you can live your life normally. It's, it's not, it's not kind can, of like, yeah. it's not kind of like, there's no kind of. Yeah, and it, so, but then the payment is then the class impediment. So then I'm not saying that you're, you're as we spoke of yeah. before, you, you're yeah. from a, a working class background, but then obviously being able to afford the few hundred pounds a month and when the uh, the fees for the consultation and everything else, mm. for a lot of people on base benefit, that yeah. is just still not accessible. Yeah, yeah. So there is still this classist element that again, I fight for, the reason I fight for the, the overarching thing is then, if you can't afford to then make others rich growing cannabis, grow your own cannabis, you can then sell it to others. If you're really good at it, you can make a hell of a living and a life. We're seeing 453,000, I think is the current number, of jobs in, in the US industry. Yeah. We could be doing the same here. Instead, we're making thousands, tens of thousands of criminals, and we're making millions more paranoid and afraid and terrified. And I, yeah, some will, and I will is push it, some people. Go get I ask you this question, though. Is it paranoia? Or is it rational fear? Exactly. It's not paranoia when they're really out to get you. Is it, you know, because I don't think it's paranoia at all. They're really out to get you. So then is it arguable, is something, that the reason we're not seeing psychosis amongst the 15,000 people that have got it prescribed is when they smoke or, sorry, they vaporize it because you're not allowed to smoke it according to the script. Mm. Um, And they are stoned, high, medicated, whatever terminology we want to use. They're not then thinking, could that noise be a police officer in a raid? Could that be my neighbor ringing the police suddenly outside on their phone? Could that be? That's not necessarily paranoia. Cannabis brain is more hyper aware, contrary to to popular belief that it doesn't actually shut down. We have neurological studies that show the hemispheric lighting up of different areas and sectors and the, uh, the neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. So actually, yeah, you will sort of connect these things. And again, if you're not then fearful of your life, which is what it is, the security of your family, your home, your job, Exactly. When that element's removed, and then if you then remove tobacco as well, which is known as a causal link towards psychosis, and well, it, it is very, it is very strange because it's like, um, so our northern Irish, our northern Ireland chapter uh, had some uh, veterans as part of it, and I remember, I remember them describing what PTSD was like. You know, like how they could just be living their normal life, and all of a sudden. They're like back in the back in the war, back in the back through walking through the streets of Northern Ireland, or back watching for snipers or whatever. And honestly, that does happen to me because mostly I'm okay. And I'm talking, I'm talking like in big grand ideas here of like how good it is to do all these things. But I still, some if I see a police car, I still go, you know, I still put my if I've my vaping, I still put it down. Like I, me and my partner were driving somewhere. I was in a lot of pain. I needed to have a vape. I was vaping and I saw a police car on the horizon. And I instinctively just went like that. Yeah. And I just went to my partner and went, oh, I don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. So you forget, you forget. And it's still ever present. It's still, it's still that the ghost of prohibition still haunts me, even though I'm, you know, past it and in, into my legal prescription and in the gray area of the, whatever what you know and i've got my can card so i'm probably most likely to be protected from the police with this and i've got my prescription so i'm protected from the police with this oh and i can take this anywhere so it puts me in a very different position to where i was that doesn't mean those things don't still affect me that doesn't mean i don't worry that someone's going to knock on my door it doesn't mean i don't like fear what my neighbors might think i still do and that's it's ingrained it's in all of us and that's gonna that's gonna take a long time to get over but that's the thing is that my son won't yeah i when i was a kid why was i so worried why was i so goody two shoes well 
cannabis is still illegal. So that's scary. Uh, that, that scared, that set the fear of God into me as an eight year old catching my stepfather. I was like, oh my, that's illegal. That's a crime. Oh my, ah, oh, that was scary. Even though he explained it and I understood after he did explain it, whatever, my son's never going to have to go through that. Yeah. yeah. So, so we've won. We've we've won. We've we've won a battle. Exactly. We've gained ground. Well, there's we are victorious. We've won. Wow. Exactly. It's, it's a pyrrhic. It's a pyrrhic victory, isn't it? You know, you know, pyrrhic victory. This phrase, a pyrrhic victory. So we've lost everything in in a, in the battle to win, mm -hmm. and we've gained not much ground from it, but we've won. Mm -hmm. And if we when we're coming back, we need to as a community solidify and concrete that victory. So that we can build off of it to to gain more and more and more victories in all of these other areas and all of these other areas of this plant because yeah. that's my speciality, my life, my cause, my purpose, my being is for its therapeutic potential. That's why I've been put on this planet is to be a messenger for this plant of its therapeutic potential. But loads of other people have different messages that are from the plant. And this, this sounds, it, doctors would be like, messages from the plant? That's, that sounds lunacy, but it's not. It's like, yeah, I'm serving my purpose by, by fighting this battle, by, by being a uh, uh, therapeutic uh, yeah, language. See, I'm changing but, my language. Med medicinal works because medicinal means yeah. medical use of. Medicinal, that's what I used to say, medicinal cannabis mm -hmm. patient. Yeah. Well, Mechanic, yeah, medicinal kind of as well, not medical, medicinal. So yeah, but yeah, uh, like that. That is what I'm about, and that is my life, and that is my cause, and that is my purpose. Mm -hmm. And I've met enough other people and learned from them who also had that as their cause and purpose. And the three that really come to mind, who aren't with us anymore, is Dennis Perone because he taught me a lot. Is Chris Baldwin because he taught me a lot. And then there's Michael Cutler, who I founded the UPA with and who tragically passed away six months later. Those three people, they taught me so much about life, about this cause, and about how it was okay for me to focus on my niche of this cause. My niche of this cause is medicinal. And that's okay for me to do that. And, to, and that's what Dennis, that's Dennis Perone, actually. Dennis Perone said it is okay for you to do that like i did that like we had to do that like you've got to do what you've got to do yep. and I, said, I just said what should i do when i get back he just goes you know what you should do you just need to do it yeah that's that's exactly you speak of messages from the plant that's again uh, i'm probably in fact the only terms that i could articulate it into others but in entirely that cannabis saved my life it changed my life it took me from a very damaged, very hateful, aggressive young man into someone that's happy to give the rest of whatever time I'm lucky enough to have to champion mm -hmm. everybody else's right. And frankly, not just for cannabis, but any any consumable yeah. substance at all. If it exists yeah. and there are cultures and people that do it, they have a right to be respected and brought well, into the tent of humanity. I should also be open and honest that like psilocybin has been a big healer for me in the time that I've been away. Um, yeah. and United Patients Alliance was purposely left open-ended, was purposely left, the cannabis was left out of the, the terminology of who we were, and the patient was, was the focus because I wanted to be able to go and move into other plant medicines and other fungi medicines, other traditional holistic medicines that have helped people. Because there's a lot of the synthetic side. I mean, these days, if you're looking at sort of what they're doing with ketamine, DMT, LSD, for example, there's a large community of people yeah. like myself. I discovered when I did that thing with the BBC. Um, yeah. So I, I would say your remit also could include that. No, that's a bit more of yeah, a, I would, a I contra would, controversial as it goes to. But it's, yeah. it's, it's the patient's choice. That, that's the that's the key. That's the key yeah. to this. It's it's not. I'm I'm not deciding. It's not on me to decide. It's on you to decide what works for you. And nobody, absolutely nobody, should be able to tell you otherwise. If you want to consume any substance for yourself, and that doesn't it doesn't impact on other people, it's your body. It's like it's, you should be able to do with it as you will. 
and government shouldn't be regulating what we do or don't put into our systems. Yes, they should be providing guidance and yes, they should be honest with the truth and yes, they should be harm reduction techniques and all of these things that can, can reduce the potential damage, but nobody should tell you what you can and can't put in your own body. The other side of that is something I had uh, Dana Larson on recently. We came up with the term, because I'm saying I get, I'm really annoyed with evidence-based harm reduction policies as a term. And I'm like, I want evidence-based uh, benefit maximization policies. It's not mm-hmm. quite as the rolls off the tongue, mm-hmm. but it's if we then maximize the benefits to get toward benefit, you go through the negative of harm then you build benefit on top. So it changes the connotation as well of saying that all dr- that implies that all drug use is harmful, so we have to reduce it, whereas it's not. Misused drugs yes. or drugs used to excess or polydrug use of certain substances and, again, in certain situations, set and setting, taken into consideration, yes, potentially problematic. But through a ubiquitous education and access to that education and testing of substances, regulated marketplaces... We've gone a bit off topic into other substances, but again, the point still stands that self-regulation of community regulation, if we then had testing of kind of, you could test your own homegrown, you could test then stuff that you're getting and going, wait, I got this batch and it's not quite what it was last month. Go yeah. somewhere and test it and go, actually, it's 5% yeah. off with the CBD. Yeah. You know, you, we need to also be able to hold them to account on one side in terms of the dealers, the entrepreneurs, and the illicit legal, currently illicit and criminalized legacy market, but also the, the currently lawful legal, that's horrible language, producers uh, that currently exist. And I think it's informed consent for the consumer, whether they be a medicinal consumer or just a consumer. And I think if we again merge, because it's the same regulations, it's the same thing you'd want. You'd want the same qu- cannabis, quality cannabis sold at a dispensary to, to anybody over 18 mm-hmm. that somebody's getting for uh, medicinal. Why, why would you not? If it's good enough for someone that, that's ill, then why would you not put a subpar product on the market? It's... So again, the creates these false dichotomies that I think a unite, unified campaign, again, mm-hmm. bringing in the medicinal arguments, the commercial, industrial, and the human rights adult access mm-hmm. could really have an impact at this current um, sort of time in history in the UK, you know? I mean, I, I think it will. I, I've always hoped for this. I've always hoped, I've always wanted, I've always wanted to build bridges and to... Mm-hmm be on good terms with other campaigners and to, you know, rec- recognize our similarities. So I'm, I'm really glad to be coming back and to be able to say that and to be able to mm. have that voice again and really, really push that message of, of like more in common than we do that divides us. The, the divides are actually minimal. They're there. If you focus on them, yeah, they are there. They, they are, right? There's always divides. Yeah. You know, it's coins, both sides, there's a divide between the two, isn't there? Yeah. There's always a divide. You can't have a coin without a divide. It's, a, it's our differences. Our, our focus di- on each side rather than the divide. And each side being relevant and respectful to each other, then each side can move forward and make a difference and have more of an impact. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we just focus on the divide, we focus on the 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 thing between we, we start like we're flipping the coin we're just constantly looking looking at it flipping around rather than actually like what is this side and what is this side and why is this one right and why is this one right you know well, i think it's, it's, we're almost, it's we're, not black and white yeah we're almost missing the bigger picture is what's the coin for what the hell can we spend it on as soon as yeah. we realize we're both sides of the same coin, we've got the fucking coin. Let's go cash it in exactly. and, go, and go create a world that we actually want to live in. And frankly, that is, if, if, if somebody needs a very specific, formulated, patented, highly profitable product provided by a pharmaceutical company, yeah. should exist alongside everybody yeah. else's right to cultivate, exactly. to access, exactly. to trade. That, exactly. and, I, and I think that, again, the language, it's all about the language here that, you can appear multi-sided and faceted yeah. when when dealing with the establishment, the the elite, and the the pro- prohib- prohibitionists. But yeah. you all have that inner unity, and I think it's being that multifaceted and being able to speak all languages, present in all spheres yeah. that would work. Whereas at the minute, well, sorry, it's, 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 it's just kind of crawl through crawl through that hole. And like I said, now is the time to tear the fucking thing open and. I think this conversation I'm hoping to our audience come and I look to wrap it up uh, shortly because I'm quite aware of time. Um, th- this goes somewhere towards 
re re reinvigorating people, re-energizing them into yeah. feeling that there is something coming. I feel this year's Product Earth, well, obviously, yeah, I'm not hired by Product Earth, so I've got to obviously uh, state that there's a, a conflict of interest there. Uh, by the way, use the code SIMPA for 10% oh, off on well, your ticket. I'm, I'm not hired by Product Earth, so maybe I could do a little plug. No, yeah, hit it. So they don't give me any money to say this. Product Earth is a really great com a, a really great event where the community can come together. It started, I think, in 2014. I went to the first one. It was really good. And it's really like a hub of creativity where everybody in the industry and in the community can come together, show what they're working on, show their ideas, show their product range, show their businesses. It's got music. It's got vendors of all sorts of different kinds. It's a really, it's a really, it's basically like the UK community hub for cannabis activists and cannabis community at the moment. Mm. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it promises to be, you know, a really fantastic day with loads of different events going on, loads of different, three days, three days sorry, a, a really fantastic event over three days. And yeah, I'm really excited to go back. The UPA will be coming back. We'll hopefully be there in force. I'm, I'm looking forward to having conversations with everyone. And I know some conversations might ne not necessarily be easy conversations. I understand that. But please, like, do come and have them with me. P do talk to us. Please do include us. Tell us, tell me what your problems are. Tell me where we could do it better. Where do we get it wrong? And what would we want to do better in the future to get it right? All these things I want to know. I don't want these, these issues and this division to continue. I don't want to to be to have any form of divisiveness between different fa i don't see factions anymore i see one big community of people that agree on some or agree on some things and disagree on others and i think that's what that's what product earth really does it, it brings it brings people together and kind of like i remember last time i was at product earth so cali blackwell and i we've got a long history of supporting each other but then at certain times we haven't necessarily always agreed she was vocally very critical of what the upa was doing and some of our work um and equally some of the members of the upa not myself but some of the members of the upa were equally critical of her so at product earth cali and i she said, can we, have, can, we have a, can we have a chat? So we did. We went off and we had a little chat and we just had a heart to heart and we both cried and we both got it out and we both said, I'm sorry. You know, we both, we both let other people's opinions of each other sway what we knew to be the truth and that is that we both have good hearts and we both are in this to make a difference to help others and, and, and that, that common ground there that we have together was was very apparent at Product Earth and you know it was so lovely to see her and I, I look forward to seeing loads of different people that I haven't seen for a long time there like it's been I've been shielding so you know I've been like hey people stay, stay away from me you know so it's going to be it's going to be pretty different um but I, I'm, I'm really excited I'm really looking forward to it and yeah I'll be I'm sure I'll see you there we'll, we'll have a good chat and uh, medicate and whatever like uh and yeah I, I can't wait yeah man look forward to it look forward to it and i suppose a, a personal anecdote actually mm. uh to tell you probably should have told us at the start actually it was product of 2016 it was the sunday peter brother set the scene it was uh about 20 degrees outside when people were camping people were high don't know why i'm suddenly getting <laughs> all uh poetic up in here but anyway no, basically it's this the sunday uh it was the upa was then finishing up things you just in quite a rousing speech. Everyone was, yeah, wow, ah, yeah. Myself included, about four rows back, sat quietly going, what is this cannabis thing? Uh, we had obviously part of cannabis, known cannabis for a long time, but this whole cannabis community was very new to me. And you asked, does anybody want to say anything? And I went, I don't know, fucking, my fucking hand was up in the air before I'd even known what I was doing. I was like, shit, I'm on my feet. I sat at the front and, and spoke, and that was the first time I ever I didn't, really, didn't really, know, really but... fucking spoke at all no. about anything. Um, in that kind of way, and yeah, got a great uh, reception from everybody. You know, yourself and several others were like, "Wow!" And we've spoke for quite a bit. And and so Jake came over from Leeds Club and kind of bullied me over to Greg and went, "Go start a club." Um, and yeah, the start kickstarted my journey all those years ago, man. So I want to say, so I didn't know that. Thank you for that. I didn't know that was the yeah. first time I spoke. Wow! Wow, you learn something new every day. Wow. 
Yeah. So in, that, so that 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 in itself, that's so that's exactly what I want to do. That makes me really happy. And thank you for sharing that with me because oh, come on. that is really what my ambition with the UPA and with my work has been. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the front I was a front man in a metal back band, so I love a little bit of attention, not gonna lie. <laughs> but yeah. it's for the cause, it's for the other people, it's for that platform to say hey well i'm going to be brave enough to talk about this openly and then who else have you come on have you, are you going to come and do this too are we going to and then i'm just you know as i say i'm just the dwarf doing that like following chris baldwin and that generation of activists that's mm-hmm. that tone that made me even able to do that in the first place so you know that meant that because i could talk about it the police aren't going to come and get me that's what they did you know, so like it's all they're the giants that I stood on, mm-hmm. and I just want to. I just want to do that. I just want to play my part, do my bit, and create a change, a lasting change that will benefit people, will benefit everyone, not just a small minority of people. That will benefit everyone. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you've articulated one of the the sort of the the image in my head is of children almost being placed on really tall sort of men. And then over time, like, you know, the apes is the ascent of man sort of image. Yeah. And they slowly sort of degrade into the ground as they, as they die and the children become men and then children stand yeah. on their shoulders. Not necessarily as children, but as generations of activists yeah. in the same way that I followed you because you guys would set up the UPA and the UKCSC and, and product earth and everything else, you know? And so then and the generation of activists will step ahead of me and then ahead of them. And it's, as you say, it's each one will have taken the victories of the previous generations and then mm. build on that and build mm. on that and build on that. But I, what I've worried for a long time and the reason I wanted to do this podcast amongst other things is to create this, this diary, this, 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 uh, a correlate, uh, what's the word? A snapshot of our yeah. culture, of our community. Yeah. So yeah. this is what it is by the people who were here, who did the things yeah. so that, yeah, we can, it's record. Speak, it's, yeah, it's, so we can it's speak a record of, of history. Yeah. It's so we can speak of, history. Speak of the greats that have been before us and honor them. So I'm trying to get a lot of the older generation activists yeah. on. And then so that no one can just say, Oh, I did that. So I know thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people before you did this. Mm-hmm. Anyone that steps there to claim this, any corporation, any entity, individual, activist, advocate, I'm sorry, you're wrong. It is the collective goes, efforts goes, of all of us. It goes so far back. Simply. Yeah. It goes so far yeah. back. Look at, you know, I'm talking history. I'm talking archaeology again. We've 2,300 BC, medicine man in China, four pounds of herbal high THC cannabis. Was it skunk? Was it skunk? Must have made him go absolutely nuts. Yeah. Four pounds of it. Wow. Can you even imagine? It goes all the way back to the t- Tibetan plateau and the first guy to go, trust me, we're going to grow this. Nah, dude, screw up. Trust me, we're going to grow this. Do you know, and again, it comes to the champions, these defenders, and we've had the darkest period for a long time with cannabis because previously it was just benign and unknown for a long period of our history. Mm-hmm. Then twinned with prohibition came the knowledge of cannabis, so it arose a new generation of champions that each few years came with a new argument. They pushed and they poked another hole in that beast and it's been pushed back. We're pushing it towards an, a precipice and a, a cliff that eventually it will fall off. And I think that it's kind of, it's such a fat beast that's going to fall in and build a bridge to that better world that we want, that it is the fall of prohibition. Mm-hmm. That's not just about the access to drugs. It's about what it does to the ecology, to the environment, to the economy, to individual, yeah. individual society. Mm-hmm. You know, there are so many more impacts to this. So again, I think the, it's it's a positive that the the UPA are coming back. Probably going to take some flack for that. I take flack. Yeah, for I mean, I'm going to I am going to take some flack for it, but you know, I'm I, <laughs> I'm ready for it. And ultimately, like, how, can, I, can I put myself in other people's shoes and understand why they'd be annoyed? Yeah, one hundred percent. I'm annoyed. Mm-hmm. I I'm annoyed about what's happened. I'm not happy about it. Mm-hmm. So can I understand why other people would be annoyed? And can I understand why they think that maybe I had something to do with that? Yeah, of course I can. I was there. I was at, the t- I was at a lot of those meetings. I was at a lot of those tables. Paul Flynn's bill, you know, we, we looked over it. We looked over the wording of it. Like we approved it for, for him to, to go with it, you know? Mm-hmm. We, we were there. So of course people are going to look to us and think that we're the ones that are to fault or... You know why? Why haven't we? Why haven't we got this idealistic world now? But I mean, I would I would say to those people like, 
we're never going to get an idealistic world in our generation. Like an idealistic world is so far in the future, we're never going to see it now. But what we can do is we can make our lives a little bit better. We can make your lives a little bit better. We can focus on the things we can do to change things. We don't have necessarily the same level of power as the establishment to change things. But that's not to say we are powerless. And I think it's really important that we own our power we own that responsibility and we and we respectfully use that together to kill this prohibition monster that's destroying all of our lives because ultimately like the powers that be they don't understand it because they don't live it right to them it's just oh how can we whatever to us to the people on the ground to the people that every day need this to help them not have a bad you know to help them just live to, to not be in agonizing pain mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we, exactly. That. It's the it's the same beast. If it is killed for the the monster that is going after the patient, it's the same monster that is going after the teenagers on a street corner, just trying to enjoy a little bit of a bag discord. Mm -hmm. The same as somebody just growing some plants to be self sufficient. It's also the same for the people wanting to grow CBD rich uh, cannabis in this country. That's, it's the same for all of us. Well, being like, yeah, every activist, every campaigner, even even the ones that have ultimately like hurt me deeply and i have been very hurt by the by the campaign ironically i said ironically i've never had a problem with a prohibitionist calling me up at night calling me a cunt mm. so, sorry for my language and probably that will make your your that's all right we, we oh, uh, that, that uh, is the truth of what happened that, yeah. that, that, that is what happened I, you know I've, ne I've never had a prohibitionist like mm. make memes about me questioning questioning my integrity like yeah. I, you would expect it that's where it would come from but it's never come from that they've never been able to get me because i've thought i thought through very hard the facade that is in front and front and facing to the media to the government and whatever to get what we want and it is a trick it is a trickster thing to do but hey ho it's a war and you can't always be honest in a war you've got to trick your enemy into believing different things and you've got to you know, you can't give them all of your intelligence. Like, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, hey, how can we be truthful and whatever, but, and I do agree with you, but we need to be mindful, like, this is not going to be easy and we need to package it in a way that's going to have the most impact and going to get what we want sooner. And I honestly believe it hasn't happened the way that it should have. And if I was in charge of it, it would be different but the paradigm has shifted from where we were before and where we are now. And we are in a much stronger, much more powerful position than we've ever been as a community. We are. And really my job now is to go and persuade those 15,000 that we need to support the 1.4 million, which I think is a vast underestimate. And that, by sending that message and keep being out there and living our lives, that that is the work that we're doing. You yeah, know, I think I think you'll gain the, you'll gain the support of every country if it's done correctly. I say correctly, that's objective, but you know what I mean. Uh, if it's done in the right way, the the people are happy. The majority of the non so let's non self identifying medical consumers are happy to go. Actually, there's wiggle room in there that we're safe, or there's yeah. that helps if, as long as there is something that even if it's by proxy or as consequence helps the larger community, yeah. you will be able to garner their support. Mm. But I think that again, and I'd like to hope, and I think the one thing that I want to mention quickly before we leave uh, is you. You see, you have fought to get the UPA back. Of what they wow. seen with the directors back and forth, and with the, trying to get the accounts and everything, and I think that's commendable. And people should know that this two years hasn't, like you said, you've been dealing with family, but you have also been battling to wow. to to get back the original entity. And I think again, that speaks volumes that you're not just rebranding and coming back and going, oh, here's a new thing, guys. You're go you've held your hands up and gone. That didn't go the the way I wanted it to. I'm going to dust it off. We're going to re rebuild and, 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 yeah. you know, and I think that's, yeah, again, yeah. that's, that's not, not everyone was willing to do that. And I was quite angry at first that some people wanted to go and form another group when I, you know, I just had my baby and really needed my team to step in and step up, but they didn't. I was very angry about that at first, but now I, now having 
done all the hard work with my PA Ollie. Oh my goodness, I completely understand and empathize why they didn't want to do it. So, you know, hey ho, it's been done. The UPA is back in my name. I am the shareholder and director of the UPA. I'm the only director of the UPA. So that means that I can set in motion its direction. And believe me, I wasn't, I never wanted to be in charge. When I set up the UPA, I was the spokesperson. And then when we when we came to create it into a company, the all of the board voted and they said, no, you have to be the director because it's, you know, I was like, uh, okay, I will. Mm-hmm. I begrudge and then throughout the whole time, I was basically trying to find someone to replace me. Because I was like, I like I don't really want to captain the ship. Like I I, I want to live my life as well. Like and captaining the ship is like draining me and I'm ill and I don't really have a good life as it is. So, you know, I was trying to find someone to do that. I identified Carly as that person. She became my deputy director. Other previous directors knew Carly was also not viable. Mm. Right. Uh, and they, they, they didn't want that to happen. So, it, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it all fell apart and then all went its separate ways. And then I'm just like, ah, headache, nightmare. Ah, what am I going to do? And I really contemplated not coming back. I really contemplated going, you know what? That's that that be the end of it. Like, let's just focus on my family. But, you know, I don't I don't want other people to have to go through what I'm now free of. Mm-hmm. And I can't in good conscience go now just live my life and not come back. You know, I stood I stood in parliament. I stood in parliament and I said no patient left behind. Mm -hmm. I give my word as a campaigner, I will not stop campaigning until every patient and every person has access to the therapeutic of cannabis, therapeutic potential of cannabis in whichever way they deem fit. I've done that. I did that. Mm -hmm. Gave my word. I can't, I literally, I can't, I can't go back on that. I can't in good conscience say, Oh, let's just leave it there then. You know, I can't go, well, I'm all right now. I can go to Legoland, so I'll be off at Legoland. See you later, everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I just can't do that in good conscience. So I'm going to do both. I'm going to go enjoy my life. I'm going to go live the life I deserve to have, and I'm going to be a record of that. And I'm going to show the world and the country and the government and everyone that wants to listen, everyone that will listen to me, I'm going to tell them, this is my life. This is my medicine. This is what helps me. And everyone, why would you deny that to somebody else? Yeah. Why would you deny a life to somebody else? Just because I have a certain level of help, meaning that I can afford it. And other people, because of my, you know, because I have MS, so that's taken seriously, right? Mm-hmm. So I've got support that other people don't have. So I've got the MS nurses team. There's a whole NH- NHS department essentially is dedicated to people with them like loads of other conditions don't have that yeah you know, like, so therefore when it comes to me needing what i need they support me and then i get everything i need mm-hmm. you know i get i get a budget from the council to hire somebody to help me with the epa yeah it's just it's i can't in good conscience not use that now to widen that to widen that door open to help other people get through that and to help other people experience this life because everyone deserves it, it's, and it's there. It's there for the taking. All we need to do as a collective is just take it, because yeah. they're, they're, it's right there. It's right there. We just need to bash, bash our heads together, forget the past, line in the sand again. I know there's been many lines in the sand, but I'm sure there'll be more in the future. But for now, legal access to cannabis for all adults and access to medicinal cannabis for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not going to argue with the legal lawful. Okay, that's, well, that's still being worked out, but we can, other, we other can than that, we're, we're spot on. Well, you, you, you get the gist of where I'm going. Uh, in, in, entirely, no, and I think that's exactly. You can, you can define. You can create the actual definition and the solid definition. Hey, I, I didn't do this. The, 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 the big I'm wigs, going. the big wigs did, but I get you. Yeah, you hear where I'm going with it, and you understand yeah. what, what I'm do. saying. And that's only going to happen if we if we actually say, do you know what? Forget the past. 
<laughs> I, I don't even I want to say even just forget the past. It's it's almost not move on. There isn't almost a word for it. Is learn the lessons and yeah, learn a lesson. Continue yeah. to continue to go. Forgiveness. It's like don't don't forget, but do forgive. Yeah, I think you can't forget what's happened because you know history is cyclical. And the same thing will repeat in a different way, in a slightly different way, and then again and again and again and again. Yeah. And that's how that's how it kind of works. But well, yeah, it's in, it's informed everything that we've done. It's like I often say to people about my, like my childhood and whatever else. I don't regret fucking anything because everything is informed who I am today. Mm-hmm. So I think as we spoke of with the almost uh, poetic karma, I guess, with uh, your stepfather's situation and yourself and your son, the, the it plays out in that way. The, the more we move forward, the way to honour what has happened previous is to win victory's future. Mm-hmm. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I guess a, a wonderful place to to end this. Um Man, this has been a, a mammoth recording, but I think yeah. one that has been well needed and I do hope goes towards healing the, the community. Yeah, I mean, and I will be honest as well and say it helps to heal me to be to be able to come and have a platform to share my story, to share what happened and to just reaffirm that, you know, whether you believe it or not, some people will still say otherwise, but I am in this for the right reasons. I'm not, I'm not gonna just drop it now that now that I'm okay. I'm now gonna try and work on helping everyone else come come with me. Like I don't I don't want to leave anyone behind at all. Um and I hope people can understand that yeah. I've done what I've had to do for my family. And that that's that is that. Like I'm I, my, my, I take my responsibility as a father very seriously. So it is a case now of family first, cannabis second. But that's always how it should be. I like that. It's a wonderful way to end this. So, yeah. Thanks again, Clark. Uh, I'm going to do a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, so feel free if you want. You can jump off now or if you want to let me just quickly go through this. Although, uh, yeah, I'll quickly go through this and then we'll talk for two minutes uh, after a recording because I, I do want to chat to you after this. Mm-hmm. So, folks, if you've enjoyed this, if you made it all the way at the end, well done, especially you... Uh, what do you call them? Uh, marathon watchers, I guess, that have watched this all in one go. Well done. You may get up now and go for a wee and go get some food, step out into the daylight and enjoy your day. Um, I hope you feel informed. I hope this has been cathartic, has been healing and helpful and useful. If so, please do check out the Simple Life on Patreon.com, where for less than a cup of coffee a week, you can help me literally keep the lights on in this place, pay for the new studio that I'm building for all this reclaimed. Screws cost bloody lot of money these days. Um, so yeah, uh, chuck, chuck us some Patreon, check us out on all social media platforms, give us a like, share, subscribe give us a rating on uh, where are we spotify those kind of platforms and yeah be wonderful to each other for next week next week's guest it's melanie sykes don't tell anyone peace and love